We are going to seven feet. Hello? Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, hello, Agnes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Dennis. Good afternoon, Fazio. Geoffrey. Um, Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you from Dennis. And uh, Aisha, too. Good afternoon. Uganda time is now uh, past midday. And uh, I can see we have about 28 participants and participants are now logging in. I would like to, to ask the panelists around, should we go ahead and start? Uh, you are welcome, uh, Joshua. I cannot hear you, Joshua, but I can see you. Let me send a chat. Can you hear me now, Agnes? Yes, clear, loud and clear. You're most welcome to the part to the today's um, webinar. Thank you. It's Looking a pleasure forward to having it. you here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. And I was asking whether we should go ahead and start. We are about 27 participants already have logged in. And I think uh, I will. I would like to draw attention to everybody listening in today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. And uh, we, were, we are going to be discussing issues around um, the economic, social, cultural rates of indigenous and minority peoples in Africa, uh, with the particular attention to the rate to health and uh, education. And um, today we are honored to have, um, we have two panels. Uh, panel one is on, on health and the panel two on uh, education. And we are honored today to have uh, the following um, panelists. And I take the opportunity to welcome you all. Um, first on the list, I have uh, Professor Joshua Castellino, the Executive Director of Minority Race Group International. And he will be taking us through I cannot speak speech, and we expect to hear more on a broader level uh, on the subject of our discussion today, that is health and education. So, Professor Joshua Castellino, you're most welcome. Thank you very and, much. Uh, okay, uh, we are also honored to have expert Leslie Jansen. Uh, expert Jesley Johnson uh, of the Working Group on Indigenous uh, Populations in Africa. He won't be directly with us. He had sent us a video recorded presentation and we will play it at the time. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Leslie. She's an expert member of the Working Group on Indigenous Populations in Africa and the Chief Executive Officer of Resource Africa. Uh, she's from South Africa, and she has also been a director at Natural Justice, uh, a lawyer and uh, interested in the environmental and social justice. She's also trained in indigenous people's rights. Leslie studied at the Loyola University of Chicago and did a master of law, rule of law, uh, rule of law for development at the University of Arizona, where she did a master of law on indigenous peoples and international law. So Dr. Lezili have gone to introduce her in detail because she will not be at the panel. We will share her video. I take the opportunity also to introduce uh, Dennis Muchunguzi, executive direct, active, acting executive director from African International Christian Ministry, AICM. You are most welcome. And um, I take the opportunity also to introduce Araso Baru Olani, and uh, he will also be on the panelists. I won't go into the details. The 
moderators of the panels will give more of the bio discussion. I take the opportunity also to introduce Daniel. Daniel Kobe is an, the founder and executive director of the OGEC People People's Program, OPDP. Daniel, you are most welcome. And I also, lastly, I take the opportunity to introduce um, Fazio Maunganize. I'm sorry if I pronounce your second name wrongly. Uh, she will also be one of the panelists. And uh, in addition, we have also Dr. Melaku. Dr. Melaku, if you are already here, you are most welcome. And uh, you will be introduced later in details. And uh, also, I will take the opportunity also to introduce um, our own Geoffrey Keros from Kenya. He will be moderating the session and uh, maybe we'll hear more about And those are the people on the panel. And uh, not forgetting um, Dr. Belkachem Loons uh, also will be moderating on the second panel. So I, the, the rest, uh, we shall be hearing more in details of the panelists themselves. And at this particular juncture, I take the opportunity to, to call upon the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Joshua Castellino, uh, to take on the floor. Joshua, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Agnes. And uh, hello, colleagues from, from Europe. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you from London, and it's a real privilege to be able to, to join you today in this uh, very important conversation around health and education. Agnes, can you confirm how much time I have? Um, you have almost um, 15 minutes. Perfect, thank you. So, so colleagues, I'm going to stick to my time very, 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 very closely. And I want to share with you a series of thoughts around four real issues when we tackle the, 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 the challenges that we face on so socioeconomic rights. I want to touch briefly first on the macroeconomic challenges that exist that underpin this, this current context. I want to speak a little bit about this challenge for states, and then I want to focus on minorities and indigenous peoples and emphasize education and health. So four sets of remarks, if I may. So first of all, that this conversation on socioeconomic rights really has to start from the fact that even though African and Asian and Latin American states now have independence for close to 50 to 70 to 90 years in the case of Latin American states, we still have not been able to break the shackles of colonization. And this has a major impact on our economies, but this also has a major impact on the current challenges that we face. So when you think about the impact of colonization on African countries, this is still a continuing legacy that is essentially subjugating African countries and keeping them down the pecking order of socioeconomic rights. Also true for some parts of, of, of Asia and for some parts of Latin America. But colleagues, the European colonization of Africa wasn't the first real attempt at colonization in global history. There have been various colonial powers at various points in time who have come to subjugate other people and take away their resources. We as Africans and Asians and Latin Americans, we have also done this to ourselves. This tendency of one community or one tribe to try and dominate and subjugate a neighboring tribe and to try and gain from their resources, unfortunately is deeply tied to human nature itself. The problem though, however, that we face today is the fact that European colonization, while it may have passed and while it may have given us decolonization and the emergence of independent states, still has left us with the legacy of what I describe as the extractive model of the economy. And that extractive model of an economy is really, really quite simply explained. It's basically you find materials in the ground, you extract those particular materials, and then you turn those raw materials into a product. Of course, many of the extractive materials that we are talking about have been extracted in Africa, but when they are extracted at source, they are deemed to have zero economic value. And so the people who actually extract those resources get very, very minimal compensation for it. Nobody ever thinks about what the cost of replenishment will be. And the result of that is our climate crisis. 
But interestingly, colleagues, when that resource is picked somewhere in Africa, it's a lump of earth. By the time it gets up the supply chain to places like where I am sitting in Europe and the United States of America and the, and the states that form the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the rich man's club of states, by the time it gets to these states, that lump of earth has gained incredible value. The problem is that value is not spread across the chain. It only accumulates at the end of it. So what I'm trying to say to you is that while colonization may have ended, the deeply colonial nature of the extractive model we have is still with us. And that extractive model is giving us our climate crisis, without a doubt. And that extractive model will continue to endure. The only difference is that now with decolonization, Africans and Asians and Latin American elites too can benefit from that value chain. So what we have at stake on, at a macro level is much, much greater. And I think efforts need to be made. And we certainly as Minority Rights Group International push the growth of an accountability, accountability for colonial crimes, but not just accountability for colonial crimes as a historic footnote. Because there's a, there's a tendency certainly in Europe to just say, well, that was a long time ago. But in legal terms, this is a continuing tort. This is a damage that is continuing into the present. Africans in general are facing up to it and vulnerable and marginalized communities within African countries are facing into it much more acutely. And of course, that's the theme of today's challenge that you face when we think about uh, health and education. So that's with regards to my first set of comments. My second set of comments then really is addressed to the state, the, the decolonized state that has emerged. Now there is a tendency, I'm from India, and there's a tendency certainly also in India to blame much of our current issues on the colonial past. In India, certainly we blame divide and rule politics on creating divisions in society. We blame with justification the fact that resources were stolen from our country to Europe. And I think many of these echoes I've seen in African countries too. And without doubt, there is legitimacy to these issues. But the question now is that the post-colonial state is 30, 40, 50 years old. South Sudan perhaps is, a new, is new, Eritrea might be new, but you've got even states, like, uh, even states like Namibia now are nearly 30 years old. So you've got in African states now quite a long period of time to be able to restructure. Without a doubt, the lack of African voice in the international community affects the extent to which African countries can really change international law, international politics, and international institutions. But at home, I think the challenges that post-colonial states face are really straightforward. Most of our states were founded on lines drawn on maps where no African, uh, no white foot had trod. So in many of these contexts, and of course you see this very, very starkly, in, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where lines drawn on maps have determined identities into the future. And we are told these identities are going to be into the future for perpetuity. So no matter what previous histories were, those hundred years of colonial rule have essentially determined who is Ugandan and who is Kenyan and who is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, that's a different question for a different time in terms of the legitimacy of the boundaries. The fact, however, is that these boundaries have created multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious states within. So the challenge really is, if we are to fulfill the vision of the drafters of the African Charter for Human and People's Rights, the challenge to the post-colonial state is really straightforward. How do you find a way to distribute resources in such a way that every African child, no matter where they are born and no matter whom they are born, can go some way towards achieving their potential. This is what I call the challenge of overcoming the accident of birth. Ultimately, as a human civilization, the belief as, as expressed by many uh, leading African jurists over time is to be able to create a society where the accident of birth is not the only factor in what a human being can achieve in their lifetime. But colleagues, that is the scenario that we still do have. Power and influence is still drawn on the lines of, first of all, male dominance, and then within that male dominance, by dominance from men from the majority. 
from the dominant class, from the dominant caste, from the dominant religion, from the dominant ethnic or linguistic group. And this is a real challenge. It's a real challenge about the extent to which these men are fully able to grasp the challenge of what it means to be born poor in any of our countries. And how will they take the measures and how will they organize society and what rules will they create to be able to ensure that the potential of every single child born on the continent of Africa is realized. Realized in a way that they can pursue their dreams, that's on an individual level, but more importantly from a collective level, realize the potential that they may have for science, for development, for sport, for medicine, for all of those other aspects that are there. We still have generated a system through legal institutions where we only have what we call equality in law and we have mass inequality in fact. And I wanna to move to health and education because that's the central element. These are the driving forces to crush the forces of inequality. If you can get a robust education system that is available to all, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their linguistic, religious, ethnic group, irrespective of their status as an indigenous people, then you have got for the first time a chance to benefit from the full talent that exists in every African country. Every single discrimination that is set up is like a, a, is like a leak from a, from a tub. It's like a leak from an oil drum. It's siphoning off talent. It's destroying the planet and it's giving us a less equal and more fraught society. Those structural inequalities we have inherited in terms of the education systems we have, but the challenge we really face is to plug those particular gaps. But there's one other comment on education I'd like to make you aware of. And I think this is perhaps for me equally important. The education that is given is the content of the education that's given is still given from the lens of a male dominant perspective. And that is a real problem, not only in African countries, also all over the world. The, the activities of history that we are taught is really portrayed as what a few men did to other, uh, to other men who they portray as less powerful. That history doesn't take into account the incredible wisdom of indigenous communities, the incredible leadership of indigenous women, the way in which indigenous communities have sheltered and protected our environment, how they have stood against forces of marketization and destruction of circular economies, and how they today are the source of hope in overcoming the climate crisis. Our education instead mimics what Western education has done. And to a certain extent, Western education itself is deeply flawed. I can tell you this, my daughter has been studying in Britain and she's been studying history. And there is no mention in British history of any of the activities that Britain did abroad. Instead, British history is a story of a few kings and a few queens and what happened to them. And colleagues we know as Africans, Asians, and to a certain extent, Latin Americans too, that that history that, that actions that were perpetrated by this state where I sit today has had major continuing impact. So the fact that children are not studying it in the 21st century is narrowing their minds. And similarly, this is also true in our own context where our history is told from a very, very narrow perspective of the dominant ethnic, religious, linguistic group or uh, settled people. We need to change that. So the education challenge is to on the one hand, the education challenge is about making sure we have a curriculum that really tackles the contemporary issues we face. We need children going to school to understand what environmental protection means. We need children going to school understanding what the power of human agency can do in changing societies. We don't need to only give them the kinds of education that restrict and narrow their minds. We need children to understand the value of diversity and how the incredible human diversity that exists provide us with several avenues to be able to tackle the greatest challenges we face. So the education challenge, I really hope that you will spend some time on, will be to think about this. I know also from my role in helping to draft the Abhijan principles, how there's a real threat to education where private actors are mobilizing and moving in and education is becoming a site of ideology. We need to contest that. The state needs to provide education to all, 
It needs to be of a high quality and it needs to be consistent across the board. And as a key, it needs to really reach the most marginalized within our societies. That's the real test. If our education system can provide remedies to the most marginalized in our societies, then we have the, the beginnings of realizing the collective human talent that exists in our communities, our regions, our countries, and our continent. My final comment then really is on health. And I think we have seen this in dire terms on the pandemic. The pandemic, when it broke, the information, the information sources were very narrow. The information was not translated into local languages. That meant that minority indigenous communities who had not yet heard about the pandemic put themselves needlessly at risk and contracted the disease. We also know that minority and indigenous peoples in many countries were at the forefront of essential services. They were the ones who had to, had to work through isolations and through quarantine periods. We also know that very often when minorities and indigenous peoples actually began to get, get the disease and began to be affected by the disease, they were turned away from hospitals where they, because of the inherent bias and prejudice that exists. We also know now at a macro level that the remedies that have been developed have been hogged greedily by Western countries who have bought much more vaccine than they need and are failing to release the formula for the production of vaccines elsewhere and failing to address the ability and the, uh, the, the scale at which the vaccines need to be committed. Colleagues, this is structural racism in a modern context. This is the context where we don't have the ability to understand what transnational solidarity means. And we don't have the empathy to understand that unless every one of us is safe, none of us can be safe. The return to a, a universal health system and the return to, a, to the ability for every single African person on the continent and every other visitor to be able to access healthcare irrespective of their status is important. It is also equally important that that healthcare that they access is of a standard that's appropriate and also once again pays attention to the rich local traditions of medicine that exist in Africa. So this is not simply a question of another site of colonization by which Western pharmaceutical companies can now gain full access to African markets. It's also a process by which we learn from indigenous communities, traditional communities, to understand what it is that all of this can do in the context of our health system. So my time is up. I, what I've tried to do is to give you something of an insight. I would urge you to think through the macro, the state level, and then the community level. Colleagues, we have a real challenge now in the 21st century. We face a period of increased fragmentation where identity politics is being used by narrow politicians to divide the human family. We need to stand firm against this kind of division, but we need to also understand that the richness of the ways in which we, we have been brought up, we think, we believe in, that richness and that diversity collectively needs to be knit together to create a vision of a better future. The African Charter on Human and People's Rights when it was framed was visionary. African jurists for the longest time have argued about Africans thinking about Africa as one and thinking about the fact that the families need to come together to unite. The real chance to do that is today and the real site to start is in being able to understand a universal health and a universal education system. I wish you very well for the, for the sessions ahead and it's really been a pleasure and I thank my sister Agnes Kavajuni for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. You're on mute, Agnes. Agnes, you're on mute. Yeah, what can I say? It's a pleasure to listen to you. And thank you so much for that uh, very, very uh, pregnant um, overview. Uh, you are listened to by over 40 people and the people are still uh, registering in. I'm opened now. Not yet, I'm open. You can hear me? Okay. So 
It's a pleasure to listen to you. And I'm saying you have over 40 people listening to you and, and more people are coming in. So for participants who have tuned in, you are again most welcome. I welcome Dr. Melaku. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm saying now we can move, but uh, I would like to take note of what um, Professor Joshua Castellino has uh, shared with us. Um, the professor has shared with us the uh, issue of decolonization in education and uh, health. And I think he has deeply explained about uh, the extractive nature of the level of education we received that goes with exploitation of the resources on the African continent and the, the devalue of those resources existing on the African continent. And I think that is very, very powerful. Again, uh, I will summarize a little bit of on what you have picked up for people who came a little bit late. Um, accountability, he emphasizes the question of rather than run us, us looking at, um, at um, the global, uh, uh, in the decolonization of, uh, of, 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 of Africa, we should look at the question of accountability of the colonial damage globally. What does that mean in terms of the education and the health systems we're experiencing today? Uh, he talked about the issue of um, decolonizing the state. And uh, I think I love the issue when you say about um, we should stop the blame game. The blame game where we keep referring to the impact of the colonialism in Africa. But we should question the 50 years or more of our states, the existence of the states in Africa. What have we done to deconstruct the, the, the systems set by colonialism that are not helping Africa to develop. What are we doing on that? And I think uh, if I re reflect you on well on that, and uh, he looks at the question of we should understand uh, that uh, the education as uh, brought in by, by colonialism, colonialism uh, was more decided, determined, uh, was more determined for particular interest. And he also talked about the issue of borders, that the borders we're experiencing in African states today were drawn again by Western colonial, colonialists with the different interests. And that means a lot of uh, multi-ethnic communities caught up along the borders, uh, how it affects on the linguistic divisions we have. And that again impacts on the, on the nature of uh, education, people receive or don't receive the issue of dominance of ethnic minorities against the others. And uh, you talked about also the question of distribution of resources and uh, how are we redistributing resources as states to ensure that we eliminate inequalities and we promote um, resources that are contributing to the growing of, of potential of the African people. Uh, and the, uh, regardless of where they're located, whether they are in rural or in remote areas or urban areas. And one of the challenges of ethnic minorities is that they are deeply located in areas underserved. Uh, you talked about the issue of power and influence and how this has gone more into the elites, into the class, into the gender and the ethnicity and how this plays to maintain the status quo of ethnic and indigenous populations. Uh, in a more marginalized situation. Then you talked about reversing of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, reversing the kind of uh, education and health systems we are accessing in the, in, in the, in the, uh, on, the, on the continent and uh, focusing more on the question of driving towards the people achieving their potential, uh, growing talents and uh, addressing issues of inequality. So you talked about that. And uh, you went deep to look at uh, the content of, of education. We need to examine what we are getting and also eliminating um, the education that focused on male domination, dominance and the focus on issues like gender and issues of ethnic minorities. And I think that is very critical because at the moment, a uh, majority of um, women are not accessing education or are dropping out of education or are not completing education. So what do we do on that area? So you raise that issue. And uh, also you talk about um, enhance, in, uh, enhancing, um, I mean, eliminating the issue of uh, ethnicity dominance, where dominance, I mean, ethnic communities 
uh, are more dominant than others in places or geographically, but also within the states or across states. So how is this one going to be done in terms of uh, education and health? I think you raised that question. And uh, I think, uh, you know, um, in, in languages used in education, for example, uh, uh, the dominant, the dominant uh, ethnicity communities are given preference in terms of language used, and that is a, an issue. So you raise that one. So you talk about practical education, that states need to look at practical education that focus on issues that are pertinent to the growth of the continent. And you raise the issues around uh, environmental uh, protection, and, the, and uh, you raise issues about addressing the climate change, and issues of uh, addressing the value of diversity and the also teaching our people in terms of how do we use the, 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 the wealth of uh, diversity to create uh, and improve uh, uh, and address challenges on the continent. And then you went ahead to focus on COVID and indigenous peoples and you raised the issues of vaccine inequality and the, that you actually used the word that is almost tantamount to structural racism and uh, you, in, you ended up by summarizing that we need universal health systems. We need to improve the healthcare services of, of standard value and the wide access. And you talked about um, uh, not forgetting indigenous medicine. So if I have not, uh, I, have, I cannot represent what you said, but that is a summary of peak of things you have raised. And I will uh, not waste more time I take the opportunity to now call upon the panelists to be ready and take on your positions. And uh, I hand over to my colleague, um, Keros Joffrey uh, from Kenya. Keros Joffrey, or Joffrey Keros, sorry to begin with your, with your last name, uh, is uh, our staff uh, with expertise around access to education and health. And uh, he's our coordinator in particular on health and education in East Africa, uh, basically working on Ethiopia and Kenya, but also offering expertise to Uganda and uh, uh, other countries as they come. So Geoffrey, you're most welcome. Geoffrey, are you listening in? Yes, yes, thank you, Agnes. Uh, for the this floor time. is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for those who have spoken, like my colleague Joshua, and those who are here to speak, uh, you are highly welcome. So now we are moving to the next uh, session, which is uh, a panel on health. We have three uh, panelists. Two of them are already here, and we are expecting Araso Babu to join us. He's from Ethiopia. I think he has some challenges joining. Uh, but let us hope that he will be with us soon. So meanwhile, we will continue with the two panelists. We have Commissioner Resire Chansen and Mukungusi Dennis. Mukungusi Dennis is from Uganda and Chansen uh, is a commissioner uh, from the working group with whom we are organizing this uh, webinar. So we will uh, start with the, the commissioner, Resire Chansen. Uh, the presentation Excuse me, will be... Geoffrey? Yes. Yes, Agnes? You are aware that the presentation is a, is a video represent, a presentation? Yes, yes. So uh, okay. I think uh, our technical people will play the video and then uh, you will ask questions which we will send to her later on. Uh, so we might not be able to get answers immediately, but we will share them on email and other platforms. So um, we can proceed to the video. Good day, uh, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. I am looking forward to uh, participating in this webinar. Apologies that I was not able to make it today. Uh, um, my name is Leslie Janssen from South Africa. I'm part of the Koi Koi Indigenous Community. I am heading an NGO called Resource Africa, who's been uh, supporting community-based natural resource management with Southern Africa community since the mid-1990s. 
Resource Africa supports rural African community efforts to secure their rights to access and use their natural resources in order to sustain their livelihoods. We help to build strong platforms for collaboration and joint advocacy to ensure community voices are heard in debates that materially affect their lives. I also serve on the African Commission special mechanism for the working group on indigenous populations uh, and now also it's been extended to minorities in Africa. I serve as an indigenous expert member from southern Africa. It was in 1999 that the question of the rights of indigenous people was first tabled in the agenda of the African Commission. A resolution was since adopted mandating the working group uh, as follows. Firstly, to examine the concept of indigenous populations in Africa. Secondly, to study the implications of the African Charter on the well-being of Indigenous communities, especially with regard to the right to equality, dignity, protection of all peoples against domination, self-determination and the right to cultural development and identity. Uh, the mandate of the working group is also to consider appropriate recommendations for the monitoring and protection of the rights of Indigenous uh, community. I just want to say a little bit on the concept of indigeneity because I think it is important to link this conversation of Indigenous peoples, their challenges to the issue of uh, health of Indigenous peoples and minorities in Africa. So the concept of indigeneity in Africa, according to the three, 2003 report of the Commission, was it that, that was also endorsed by the AU in 2005, um, says in post-colonial Africa, it refers to the concept of indigenous people, refers to those communities in Africa whose cultures and way of life differ considerably from the dominant society, and whose cultures are under threat, and in some cases to the point of extinction. The survival of their particular way of life depends on access and rights to their traditional lands and the natural resources they own. It also refers to those communities who suffer from discrimination as they are regarded as less developed, less advanced and other more dominant advanced than other more dominant sectors of society. It also refers to those communities in Africa who live in inaccessible regions, often geographically isolated, that suffer from various forms of marginalization, both politically and socially who are subjected to domination and exploitation within national, political and economic structures that are commonly designed to reflect the interests and activities of the national majority. And lastly, also, it refers to communities who also self-identify as Indigenous. So it is crucial that these critical human rights situation of these communities is addressed. And for this purpose, it is necessary to have a concept by which to highlight and analyze uh, their situation. Indigenous peoples is today a term and global movement fighting for rights and justice for those particular groups who's been left on the margins of development, who are perceived negatively by dominant mainstream development paradigms, whose cultures and lives are subject to discrimination and contempt, linking up to a global movement, applying the term indigenous people is therefore a way for these groups to address the situation, analyze the specific forms of inequalities and repression they suffer from and overcome human rights violations by invoking the protection of international law. And so it's this modern analytical understanding of the term indigenous peoples with its focus on marginalized, marginalization, discrimination, cultural difference, and self-identification that has been adopted by the commission and which has been endorsed by the AU, as I've mentioned. Coming to Article 16 of the African Charter, it emphasizes state parties shall take the necessary measures to protect the health of their people. However, the health situation of Indigenous people is often very precarious. It receives very limited attention from the responsible health authorities. And this has to be seen in connection with the general marginalization that Indigenous people suffer from economically and politically. On top of this, Indigenous peoples often live in remote areas where they are easily forgotten. As Indigenous peoples, 
receive little, little political attention and prioritization, and as they do to a large extent suffer from impoverishment and low literacy rates, their health situation is in many cases extremely critical, and this is a violation of Article 16 of the African Charter. The infrastructure um, in most areas occupied by Indigenous people is either lacking or is inadequate. Yeah, Social services such as schools and health facilities are few and far between, while the roads and other physical infrastructure is equally poor. This has had a negative impact on the staffing levels, quality of services that's been offered, and as a result, illiteracy levels and mortality rates in, in these areas are higher than national averages because of low educational levels. Indigenous peoples also find themselves with low per capita incomes, low and decreasing life expectancy owing to poor nutritional standards and basic health care status. The protection of rights to land and natural resources is fundamental for the survival of indigenous communities in Africa. And this fundamental issue of lands and natural resources cannot be separated from the issue of health, which is very systemic throughout the region. Health in the cosmology of indigenous communities relates to well being. Well being on its end is tied to their collective survival, which, as we all know, is represented by largely their lands and natural resources as affirmed by UNDRIP as fundamental to their collective survival. Indigenous pastoral and hunter-gatherer communities in Africa have traditionally occupied areas well endowed with natural resources. Such territories were adequate in size and ecological parameters mediated and supported the sources of their livelihood that formed their biocultural heritage. Yeah? Additionally, those territories that occupied is historically represented by biodiversity rich areas locating their food and medicinal sources through the uses of flora and fauna. And this interdependence with their biocultural ecology is a massive part of what sustained and in many ways continue to sustain not only their health, but their collective well-being and dare I say survival. Indigenous traditional medicine and deep knowledge of local biodiversity and pharmacopoeia, including anti-inflammatory or plants, coupled with Indigenous holistic concepts of health, are important resources for Indigenous peoples to maintain their well-being, even when they do not have access to national health structures. Their use of traditional medicine is specifically protected by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, but more specifically by the UN Convention on Biodiversity, Article 8. The African Commission's working group has been closely following the situation of COVID-19 in Africa as it impacts especially uh, Indigenous communities and now also minorities. And the working group has been concerned about the precarious conditions in which the majority of Indigenous populations, especially women, live, which includes extreme poverty, lack of clean water, lack of decent housing and toilets, posing a real hygiene and health problem and thus constituting a real risk for the spread of COVID-19. All reports continue to highlight the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 within an already problematic access to health care, which is located in national context as it pertains to women and vulnerable groupings. These communities face structural inaccessibility to health care services due to lack of resources and the remote location of health centers, as well as the inappropriateness of national health policies to the indigenous way of life. In the report of the current UN Special Rapporteur, the OGIC Development Program in Kenya, in their report stated many communities cannot afford personal protective equipment during COVID and the distribution by public authorities may reach remote communities too late or not at all. The working group noted that the responses of some states to COVID-19 have 
um, had and continues to have a disproportionate impact on Indigenous people, including the closure of markets in Indigenous areas, which curtails their livelihoods, as well as restrictions on mobility that hamper their pastoral activities. What I can share in terms of the sub-regional trends as it pertains to health and well-being in Southern Africa, it being closely linked to marginalization and poverty. These indigenous communities are all not formally recognized by their states. They face serious ongoing structural challenges due to their non-recognition as cultural communities, due to the non-recognition of their way of life and the indigenous languages. So with the onset of COVID-19 epidemic, their existing challenges were even more exacerbated, as I'm sure it was for all indigenous communities in the region. One such example was in South Africa with the issue of food relief in the height of the outbreak of COVID-19, where the South African government distributed through recognized traditional leaders um, food packages to their communities but because indigenous communities were not formally recognized they had to additionally raise awareness efforts for not having access to food relief systems because thereby placing them in an even more particularly situation and the reason this food relief missed these communities is because they are not formally recognized and not having that access to justice and the public services uh, as required, such as in this case. The working group urged state parties previously to make every effort to ensure Indigenous people have access to information on measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, including translation into local Indigenous languages and the use of accessible means of communication the working group further urged state parties through its declaration to take the necessary steps to ensure the health and well-being of vulnerable groups, including indigenous communities, by facilitating their access to safe drinking water, soap and sanitizers, accessible and appropriate health facilities, and other basic social services. The working group also urged the state parties concerned to take in consideration the way of life of indigenous peoples in all decisions taken for the prevention and control of COVID-19 with a view to addressing their specific needs for a strategic response to this ep epidemic among indigenous communities and it called on all involved representatives of these communities to ensure to make sure that their free prior and informed consent is obtained in all decision making and actions concerning them in respect of COVID-19. Um, African agricultural producers and creators of indigenous artwork, as well as gatherers of, of small forest products, um, they too have been impacted and unable to sell their goods within the region. In North Africa, the Berber people live overwhelmingly in rural areas, and rural areas have the worst socio-economic socio situation. The Moroccan Amazigh organization submission to the UN Special Rapporteur stated Indigenous communities' strong sense of solidarity has been crucial for the survival of individuals and communities as a whole. Indigenous women um, were playing and continues to play a pivotal role in this respect. In Morocco, Indigenous women were transmitting the trans traditions uh, to help members of their own communities and other tribes through small fundraising activities to alleviate the difficulties of families most in need during the lockdown. The, the situation for Indigenous people in cities is, is also not necessarily better. Many displaced Indigenous families in urban areas live in poverty and in overcrowded housing and suffer deep racism and structural discrimination and further hinders their access to basic health and social services and protective equipment. And I, I know in South Africa, in the urban context, we can certainly testify to that. The pandemic has, has therefore exposed weaknesses and exacerbated disparities in public health and social security systems, leaving indigenous people behind in national responses, compounding the wider range of systemic violations they already faced. 
I want to just refer to some examples from the country context, include but are not limited to, for instance, the Sun communities in Namibia, who are also affected greatly by poverty and its effects on health. The major health concerns include tuberculosis, malaria, HIV AIDS, gastrointestinal problems, teenage pregnancies, pneumonia, and then also alcohol abuse, uh, which is located in a history of historical colonialism and dispossession. So um, there are there are mobile health facilities for the sign, as they are in Botswana. However, this remains inadequate. The Batwa in Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda continues to be severely discriminated in terms of healthcare also linked to poverty and marginalization with limited access to primary health care um, with reports of not obtaining medical care for themselves or their children. Malnutrition rates um, are high, continues to be high. Health statistics are generally poor in the Great Lakes region in such circumstances, the Batwa with neither land or other resources with which to feed themselves are among the first to suffer. Malaria is one of the most dangerous diseases ravaging the Burundi population, particularly women and children under the age of five. The situation of the Batwa in the DRC is similar to that of the Batwa in Rwanda, Burundi and Uganda, where the, uh, the challenges of extreme poverty continues. Many of the pastoralists in East Africa and the Horn of Africa have very limited access to health facilities and their health situation is thus precarious, but my colleague Dr. Malaku will uh, expand more on the East African context uh, tomorrow. Reports further indicate a correlation between confinement and a rise in domestic and other violence against uh, Indigenous women, in the, especially in the context of the outbreak of COVID-19. I want to close with the observation that the, the issue of lack of proper health care and well-being of these vulnerable communities in Africa remains a serious and worrying regional trend that undermines and, dare I say, violate Article 16 of the African Charter as it pertains to indigenous communities and minorities in the Africa region. And until the governments of Africa take responsibility for striving to ensure that all their citizens have equal access to appropriate development the indigenous peoples of Africa will continue to be on the bottom rung in African countries. Indigenous peoples represent a unique cultural and social reality faced by very serious human rights violations that mainstream society refuses to accept. Denial of the existence of indigenous people in Africa has tended to be the official position of African governments who argue that all Africans are indigenous, thereby suggesting that there is no legitimate grounds for what they maintain is preferential treatment of a Okay, sorry, um, the video, um, I'm informed that the video failed at some point, uh, but we have gotten the gist of the matter and the important work that the, uh, the working group on indigenous population and the communities in Africa is doing, more especially in, push, in pushing for the agenda of the indigenous people. So that was a very detailed overview of the state of access to health from the commission, uh, from the working group through Commissioner Basiria Chansen. So now we uh, we will go to specific countries, two of them, uh, whereby we will look at uh, exactly what is happening. And we are starting with uh, Mukungusi Dennis, 
uh, who, will, who will talk about the state of access to health to the ethnic minority and indigenous peoples in Uganda with a focus on Patwa. So Dennis, you will have 10 minutes. So for those who don't know Dennis, Dennis is a acting executive director of African International Christian Ministry, AICM, a non-government organization aimed at creating a transformed and self-sustained community in Africa. He has worked closely with the marginalized part of population, documenting their human rights violations. So I will now give the floor to Dennis to share with us in 10 minutes uh, what, uh, how, what is the situation in access to healthcare for the Patwa. Please take the floor, Dennis. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, and members listening in. Like Jeffrey introduced, my, introduced me, I'm called Mchungs Dennis. I'm the acting executive director, African International Christian Ministry. We are an NGO located in southwestern Uganda. AICM has worked with Batwa, a minority, uh, uh, a minority ethnic group in Uganda for over 30 years in areas of human rights, advocacy, health, education, livelihood improvement. Uh, and other areas, including resettling them, because ASM bought over 500 hectares of land and resettled Batwa in Kawale, Rwanda, and part of Kisoro. So ASM has been doing that work for quite a long time. And we have worked closely with the local authorities in Kawale and Rwanda, especially the education office and the DHO's office, the, the, the district health office, to ensure that the battle health services, to ensure that the battle access health services. Um, we, in the area of education, we have also been able to establish schools in the battle uh, resident communities, and the ASM provides cost materials, provides meals, pays the teachers, the staff in those schools to ensure that uh, Batwa, 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 Batwa education and the health, to ensure that Batwa education are uh, given priority. The number of interventions have been made. Uh, I want to dwell more on the research. At the beginning of this year, 2021, AICM in the partnership with MRG, with support from the, from the government of Finland, conducted a research, conducted a, a, a study on access to health and education services among about of southwestern Uganda in the four districts of Kawa Alexoro, Abundiburgyo, and Rwanda. And the research findings were disseminated to, to different stakeholders. Uh, but what was mostly uh, found out during that research was that uh, the dropout rate among Abato was at 51.4%. I will not go much into education. I will basically look at the area of, of, of health. It's uh, supposed to what I've been asked to, to, to basically present on, but we made that research basically on health, access to health and education services in Western Uganda, in Southwestern Uganda, among the Batwa. So on access to health, we realize, we, we, we compared a, a, a lot of information and we looked at the UBOS, uh, UBOS statistics of 2014, 2016, and 2018, which showed that Excuse me, Dennis. Yes, Agnes. This is Agnes. I'm sorry to, to, to cut you short. Can you increase on your volume? Uh, they are asking. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me very well? So we conducted research on access to battle health and education as ICM and Minority Rights Group International in, at the beginning of this year. And I've already given a figure that the dropout rate was at 51.4%, but I will not look a, a lot on education, I'll focus on health. And the, regarding health, 
we compared a number of researches that have been conducted among Abatwa. And we realized that according to UBO statistics of 2014, 2016, and 2018, Abatwa have been falling below average compared to other nationals or citizens, especially in the area of immunization coverage, at netto care, and access to clean water. And the child mortality rate for children under five among about a population in 2000 was still at 41% against the national average, which was at 43%. The same thing in 2016, water coverage was at 43% against the national average, which was at 78%. And we found out a number of factors that were hindering Batwa from accessing uh, health services. One of them was longer distance to health facilities. In the areas we went to in Kaba, in Rwanda, Kabala, and Xoro, we realized, we found out that Batwa walk long distances to health centers, or uh, more than five kilometers to a health center. In areas where we, we, we went, we realized that it was not even possible, it was not next to impossible to, to, for a pregnant mother to, to move from where they stay to the nearest government health facility. And these people stay in high, in, in, uh, above in the, in the hills, in the mountains, with, with, with poor services like roads. And so moving from, from that top hill up to down where the health center is, is quite, quite difficult. And so most of them end up uh, losing out on, on health services. Then there were also cases of lack of drugs or medicines in the available health facilities. Uh, we are all aware that in most cases, government hospitals uh, do not have enough drugs or medicines. They prescribe for you uh, uh, like three sets of medicines, and at the end of it all, they give you one piece, one set of, of medicine, let's say chloroquine. And the Batwa, given their, their, their income levels, they do not afford to buy the extra medicine that is not provided for, that is not provided to them by the health facility. So that was also the main challenge. Another thing was the difficulty in finding health workers at the health facility. In most cases, even when they maneuver and move to their nearby health facilities, we, had, we, we found out cases of them not finding health workers at those facilities, and that demoralizes them. They do not go again. That case was found out in Iksoro district in southwestern Uganda, where they complained of going to health facility. They wait for so long without a health worker to attend to them, and eventually they decide to, to, to resort to their local hubs, to, to, to their local medicine. There were also cases of lacking uh, proper, proper sanitary materials for women and girls. If you are going for antenato, if you are going for uh, to deliver to the health facility, there are some requirements, especially the sanitary towels that these ladies should go with, the basins and the other requirements. And most time, most cases, but do not have. And when they lack, they end up uh, uh, um, deciding or, 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 or opting to to deliver from homes or to go to traditional bus attendants in their homes because they do not have the required materials or necessities uh, required for them to, to go to the health facilities. Then there are cases of language barrier between them and the health workers. These minorities like Batwa and the other minority communities like the Maragoli and the Benet, most of them are not, are not well educated. So in the, they, they post other people to work in their areas who do not understand their language very well. And because they do not understand their language, Batwa and other, these other minorities struggle to express themselves or to explain them to these people who do not understand their language. So we found it as also a challenge that they, they, they really struggle to, to explain to health workers who do not understand their language. Uh, we conducted this research, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we also found out high cases of early marriages, teenager pregnancy among Abatwa was very, very, very high. And uh, these cases are from the neighboring uh, communities, the neighboring, the non-Abatwa, who take advantage of Abatwa because of their 
they, 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 they have vulnerability. They, they, most of them do not have land, their incomes are so low. So the non batwa the non, the, their neighbors take advantage of them. And so teenager cases were very, very, very high. There were also cases of 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 of, of, of immunization and antenatal care. Remember, they move long distances. So when when cases of lockdown came in, COVID-19 restriction, it affected them so much. They could not easily move from where from their uh, areas of residence to health facilities. Remember, they stay in hard to reach areas on top of the hills. Uh, where, where the facilities are very poor, they do not have radios, we found them without gadgets like radios. So even when the government was announcing, uh, making uh, putting announcements on radios and televisions, these minorities could not really access the information because they lack those gadgets. So they missed out on a number of services, health services during the COVID-19 pandemic. They, they, most of them did not receive government masks what they were giving out as a precaution for COVID. They didn't access ARVs, those who were on ARVs, they didn't get HIV uh, services. Uh, I, most, of, most of those services, they missed out during the pandemic. So a number of measures have been during, we had to engage a number of stakeholders regarding about health and education. And uh, what came out during our different engagements was that there is need for an affirmative action on health and education. Uh, the, the local authorities here and the central government, they need to really put it into consideration and consider Batwa and these other minorities and put that affirmative action for them, especially in the areas of health and education. We are trying to see whether how they can be put on those school management committees and the health center management committees so that they're able to, 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 to encourage their fellow Batwa and the other minority people to, uh, to, uh, to get services from the health center and the, and the schools. We also, we are also working out with the local authorities here, especially the DHO's office, to extend the health services as outreach programs. To extend, health service programs to, to Batwa and also other minorities that work with like the Benet. The Benet people, most of the, the, they are those that were resettled by the government, but they are also those that stayed uh, up in the hills. And so where they stay up in the hills, the Benet do not really have access to, to services. They are left out in most of the cases on services. So our call to the government has been, please consider these people. They are fewer in the number, but they are also Ugandans. They need services like any other Ugandan. That has been our call to, to, to government. Then we also looked at issues of language. Where Dennis, the most- Dennis, Excuse me, Dennis. Yes. You can summarize yes, because uh, time is over. Okay. Yes, I'm almost finishing. Okay. Issues of language, they are less educated, the, the Benet, the Maragole and the Batwa, they are less educated and people who work with them are from other tribes. So we are looking at issues of government considering their language into the, this uh, other curriculum and the ministry uh, system. So that, those, those, those were the findings that we conducted as, as, as ASM on the, and, and the MRG. And the main thing is putting an, an affirmative action because there are fewer in the number. And unless there's that affirmative action, they will, not, they will continue to be left out on most of the government services and the other areas like health and education. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dennis from African International Christian Minister, uh, AICM, and for the wonderful presentation. It has very common uh, themes, for example, uh, issues like adequate access to drugs, uh, which points out to inadequate allocation of resources to indigenous peoples, language challenges, uh, where indigenous peoples are unable to express how they are feeling to the healthy workers and also early marriages. 
Uh, these are common themes with, which might uh, play out in other presentations. Uh, now, I give this special opportunity to Bob Arasso. Bob Arasso, uh, sorry, sorry, not Bob, but Arasso Paru. Arasso Paru is from Ethiopia. Um, he's a, a, a lecturer at Abraminj University. Uh, and also he works for SRAM and the Rural Health Initiative, Ethiopia. And uh, he has also, to, with this community, known as the E2 Kareyu community, they have conducted a research on access to education and healthcare. Uh, but in this specific presentation, he will present on access to healthcare. So he will look at the state of access to health of ethnic minority and indigenous peoples in Ethiopia, with a focus on those two communities, the Itu and the Kereyu pastoralist communities in Ethiopia. So the floor is yours, Buana Arasu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I proceed? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey, uh, for introducing me uh, and for inviting me to, to this uh, uh, discussion. I am Arar Sobaru, and uh, I'm going to present uh, the states of uh, access to healthcare among Itu and the Karayu pastoralists in Ethiopia. Uh, actually, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, the country is home to about 15 million uh, pastoralists, according to the source from UNICEF and the EDHS, the Open Democratic Health Survey. Those pastoralists are uh, uh, mainly living in remote parts arid parts, also dry parts of uh, the country, uh, which is also difficult to access. Uh, of those pastoralists, uh, most of them are uh, primarily uh, living in uh, four uh, regions, uh, namely uh, Somali region, Afar region, Oromia, and uh, Southern parts. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, one of the pastoralists that is uh, uh, inhabited in Oromia, which is known as uh, Itu and the uh, Karayu pastoral uh, community. Uh, Itu and the Karayu pastoral communities are inhabited in Pentale district of Oromia, uh, which is bordering uh, Afar to the north and the Amara region to the northwest and uh, the other side by Oromia. Uh, Itu and the Karayu pastoral communities are transhumant whose economy are uh, mainly uh, depends on livestock production. They migrate seasonally uh, from one place to another, particularly within their own uh, indigenous area, uh, but they, mi they migrate miles, sometimes up to uh, beyond 100 kilometers from where they res uh, reside during the dry season for the search of uh, water and the grasses for their uh, community, uh, for their uh, livestock. Uh, why access to healthcare for Itu and the Karayu matters? Uh, with the help of uh, a, a small grant from Minority Rights Group International, uh, in the last August, we are able to uh, collect data, uh, primarily uh, qualitative data uh, from the community. Uh, so the reason why healthcare for Itu and the Karayu matter is that, uh, as common to all pastoralists, in Africa in general and in Ethiopia in particular, uh, they are disadvantaged communities who are difficult to access healthcare uh, due to uh, their culture, their economy, uh, lack of awareness, uh, system factor also, because system is mainly, uh, the current system, particularly in Ethiopia, is mainly uh, geared towards serving the stable population, the system structured by itself. The other, the lifestyle of the community, their livelihood. Uh, as I said before, they mainly practice pastoralism and they migrate from one place to another. And there is also geographical factor, which is also common to the Itu Karayu pastoral community. From uh, the perspective of health for all in current Ethiopian system, just considerable limitation in reaching pastoralists because the current uh, practice of health mainly, it is saying uh, static health posts, which could not address the mobile population, such as Itu and the Karayu uh, pastoral communities. Thus, uh, the pastoralists, including Itu and the Karayu, are largely excluded.
from the primary health care, such as immunization and institutional delivery. This is the few of them I'm addressing because human beings need access to health care during emergencies for various reasons also. But I'm mainly focusing on immunization and institutional, uh, institutional delivery, uh, which pastoralists are currently lack of within Ethiopia. Uh, as a methodology, uh, we did a focus group discussion, key informant interviews and in-depth interview for this uh, particular research. Uh, because we are unable to, because they, they are dispersed, widely dispersed, and we are unable to uh, produce quantitative data uh, because they are widely distributed uh, over large geographical area. And uh, uh, there is also a lack of previous studies in this particular community. So as a baseline, we started with a qualitative uh, and we did in last uh, August, uh, August 2021. Uh, as uh, main uh, identified results in this is, I will focus on uh, main identified uh, barriers in accessing health service among each and the first courage pastoralists because I have limited time. Uh, one of the main barriers is uh, there is a seasonal drought and a loss to follow up, particularly uh, for antenatal uh, care. Uh, there is also loss to follow up for immunization program because during this dry season, as I said, uh, they migrate from one place to another. And uh, the water, sometimes they uh, store water in forms of ponds that can, but can sustain more than months. After that, they are forced to migrate from one place to another. So there is a high likelihood of loss to follow up and there are some of our key informants and the, uh, the in-depth interview participants also responded uh, to this. Uh, but when they migrate, the problem is that it's not about their migration. They lost to follow up and at their new destination, uh, the respondents uh, told us they lack the, uh, access, they denied access to healthcare at new destination because the existing system is uh, not allowing them to take, uh, to follow uh, or to start their follow up at the new destination. Uh, so that means there is no system that link seasonal migrant to existing health system at their new destination. For example, uh, one of the quotes that our respondent said is that. Uh, although there is health post closure to our new destination, we are not allowed to access health service from it because we were told to get service only from health post of our previous residency, which is very far from us. As a result, we can't continue our follow-up. This is one of uh, the respondents lamented the situation to us. So uh, they need a system uh, that can link them to the a healthcare as a new destination. Also that such system is lacking because the existing health system in Ethiopia is focusing on a stable population, that is settled population. And uh, it is not considering the mobile population such as pastoralists. This is one of the problem we identified. The other problem is there is cultural acceptability of modern medicine. They lack awareness about modern medicine. Although there are efforts done by governments, NGOs, and the other stakeholders, still the community lacks awareness about the importance of uh, modern medicine. Similar to most of the pastoralists in Africa, as stated by previous researchers such as Abakar in 2018 and Estup in 2021, they distrust modern healthcare program, and this is hindering utilization of healthcare services, including institutional delivery, immunization, and the others also. There is a common saying to Karayu uh, pastoralist and each one the Karayu pastoralist, which they commonly usually say as a proverb in their community, they say, one ijole harumut isan, literally means mothers know how to heal the children using traditional medicine. So their priority is to traditional medicine. They also say it is not medicine that cure disease, but gota, that is a, a, a gut, that is gut, traditional gut. So their priority is just praying and also their priority is just uh, to give preference for uh, traditional medicine. 
this is all about awareness. They lack awareness. So they need, because they need outreach, the government should emphasize on this to make equity, equality and the, uh, equity in access to healthcare because access to health carries human rights as stated in WHO constitution. And Ethiopia is also one of the country that is uh, practicing the WHO's constitution. Uh, in addition, there is incompatibility of some activities with local culture. The, the activities uh, uh, currently- uh, Excuse me, Alasso, you, you have or, two minutes. All right, all right. I'm finishing, I'm about to finish. There is incompatibility of some activities with local culture, such as institutional delivery is one of effective intervention to reduce maternal mortality. However, in each and the Karayu pastoral communities, incompatibility of some practices with local culture is hindering access to institutional delivery because they follow some rituals, for example, According to the local culture, they buy placenta, which is not allowed at health institution because of maybe misconception, misunderstanding between or miscommunication between healthcare provider and them. They also have follow some rituals when they for newborn, uh, which they can't get at healthcare facility, which can be prevented if an enabling policy uh, can be utilized for this particular community. Uh, lastly, lack of access to uh, basic social services and the infrastructure to attract healthy worker workers. Uh, because healthy worker war workers, they move with them and they, there is no sufficient facility for healthcare provider. As a result, they stay in nearby town and they travel daily to the uh, far distance. As a result, they are unable to provide uh, healthcare service they need for that particular society. Geographical inaccessibility of the healthcare and lack of transportation is also very common to this community. According to WHO, uh, everyone has the right to access primary healthcare for uh, within five kilometer radius. However, it is common among Karayu pastoral, Karayu and the Itu pastoral um, uh, communities uh, to travel 30 to 35 kilometers to get access to primary healthcare services. One of the healthcare providers we have interviewed said that women are traveling long distance, uh, uh, carrying child on their shoulder as health facilities far from their residency. They sometimes arrive health facility once time has gone. It is strict to even them, uh, to let them women go back to their home because they arrive home, returning back from all the sports in evening. Even that is strict to the uh, healthcare provider. As a recommendation, as a recommendation, Ethiopian health system need a change and innovation to make service more readably access to pastoralists in general and each and the Karayu part in particular. Each and the Karayu pastoralists need physical accessibility of healthcare that harmonize the local culture. For example, in other parts of Ethiopia, there is maternity waiting home, which is built for a stable population and they are accessing, but which is less common to the pastoralists and they are never benefited because that maternity waiting home is to prevent two of the three delays in access to uh, maternal, in preventing maternal mortality. So such things are also not built for this particular pastoral community and also for other pastoralists in Ethiopia. This is all about, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Araso uh, Baru Orani from Ethiopia and for your wonderful presentation on Itu and Kereyu pastorist community from Oromia. Oromia is a state in Ethiopia, for those who have not been to Ethiopia uh, before. So basically is addressing the issues of lack of awareness on the importance of modern medicine and uh, also the issue of in, in, inaccessibility, inaccessibility in terms of distance traveled because of poor infrastructure, in terms of roads, and other means of getting to hospitals. So people are walking up to the five kilometers uh, to access healthcare, which is uh, uh, far below the international standards. So thank you, Arasu. And now I will open this. I will, I will actually hand over to Agnes uh, to do the question and answer session. Uh, for those who have questions, you can uh, ask the questions through Agnes. So back to you, Agnes. 
Yes, uh, Geoffrey, thank you so much. But uh, I thought maybe you can continue with moderating the session because you understand better. You've been listening to this and uh, taking note of this. So can I throw it back to you? OK, no problem. Thank I, you I so much. At the, at the program. So now I will open up this session uh, for people to ask questions or make brief comments. Uh, that because we are many, I think we are around for the two participants. Uh, please stick to one question or one comment so that everyone, maybe uh, like five people can get a, a, a chance to say something. So let us uh, start. You can raise your hand. Uh, there is an icon down there at the bottom uh, with an hand raised up like this. You can click on that, then I will call your name. Okay. Um, maybe I can meanwhile uh, look at what people are saying on the comments. Uh, as I wait to see who is uh, raising their hands, I can see uh, people are relating what is happening in these two communities uh, with what is happening in their communities. For example, the a wild community in Boni Forest. This is from Boni Ahmed. Uh, is saying that the, the wild community are facing similar challenges. High rates of illiteracy, access to education is, a, is a difficult. So they are agreeing with uh, the panelists. Uh, there is uh, actually one hand here. There is somebody from DRC. Uh, the name is not, uh, it's not there, but it is Rabbi. Rabbi from DRC. Please, you can unmute and speak and ask your question or comment. Uh, Rabbi, you are on mute if you can speak. Uh, maybe if, uh, Rabbi, okay. We can try Samuel Ayaru. Samuel Ayaru. Hello. Vous me suivez? Ah oui, si, si. Bon, en fait. Euh... He's a called Donatien Mouliali, president of RAPI from DRC. He, he had uh, internet challenges and. Uh, the challenge uh, with the interpretation is that the, the connection is uh, not uh, quite well. He want to share something on discrimination. He... Okay, merci beaucoup. Um, en fait, uh, au niveau de la RDC, uh, the level of DRC, the question of discrimination, is uh, quite huge. Things that we have been living and uh, and are still living right now have not. Uh, uh, we have not had uh, great changes uh, at the level of DRC. We are struggling to have a, a law uh, that will protect and promote the right of indigenous communities. The, the law was uh, adopted in uh, 2021, April 2021. Uh, was voted uh, April 2021. Hello? Hello? Can, can you get me? Yes, we can get you. The struggle uh, started uh, in 2012 with the uh, data collection. Data collection. And today in 2021, we are now seeing the fruits of uh, the struggle and uh, we have a law that protects and promotes the right of indigenous 
communities of uh, GRC. We are also uh, struggling to see how the law can uh, uh, protect the right of the communities. We also have another uh, situation where uh, the, uh, some communities and some leaders uh, do not want to see that uh, the right of indigenous communities are being promoted and respected. Uh, it's good to, uh, uh, it's also good to uh, work in collaboration with the decision makers, especially with regard to legislators in, in order for us to use the, the law and uh, uh, benefit from all what it, uh, it uh, entails. We are uh, finding challenges, uh, seeing people who want to now call themselves people, uh, indigenous communities. And uh, we are struggling to see uh, how we can uh, promote our rights. And the UN DRIP, uh, with the support of UN DRIP and the, the law that was uh, put in place in 2021, and equally the African Charter, will enable us to have uh, uh, documents and uh, documents that will enable us to promote and protect our rights. Uh, if there are other uh, activities that we wish to put in place, we will uh, not hesitate to, to share with you in order for us all to be aware and, and support the indigenous communities of DRC in this, with regard to this uh, issue. Uh, when the time comes, I will be able to share with all of you. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Donatien from DRC uh, for the comments. And uh, just to respond, maybe we will uh, share the presentation okay. of all the panelists so that those who are having uh, internet challenges you can be able to catch up uh, with what we were discussing. So let me go to Ethiopia. There is uh, Geremu. Uh, please let us keep our comments or questions very short so that others can speak. I can see there are like five people uh, who want to, to speak. Uh, please, Geremu, then Samuel. Geremu. Are you there, Geremu? Okay, Samuel, Samuel, can you take over and ask a question or a comment quickly? Yes, thanks everyone. I just wanted to comment on two areas of health and education. Uh, among the, the indigenous minorities in, in Africa and Uganda in particular, we have the, the, the main uh, language barrier between service delivery, service providers and the, the recipient, the stakeholders. So I would recommend that we go for affirmative action by the government of Africa and Uganda in particular to address the issue of language in schools. We, we, we have to make sure that the curriculum is develop in the indigenous people's languages so that our children are able to get the gist of the education from their mother tongue. And secondly, in order to, uh, to get uh, services closer to them and in a language which they understand, these children after graduation in their several fields of education will be able to give back to the communities in their mother languages. I just wanted that part to be a part of the recommendation from this uh, Zoom meeting that we are able to take to our, uh, our government and assert our rights as indigenous peoples of, of the world, that we are entitled and it's a human rights for us to, to have our cultural uh, languages retained and used in the schools. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Samuel, your point is taken. Maybe one more person, maybe I can give to Christine Kandia from Kenya, uh, to balance the gender issue. Then from there, um, I'm sorry, the others you can drop your comments under the chat, chat box, then we will respond or the panel is with Yes, Christine. Uh, thank you, Toffee, for the opportunity to speak. I'm 
Christine Gandia, working for Endorise Indigenous Women Empowerment Network. This is a uh, this is a CBO that works to raise the voice of Indigenous women and persons with disabilities. So I, I wish to thank the panelists for good and rich discussion and even uh, opening up our minds in regards to the level of education and uh, the kind of new colonization that we experienced up to this uh, time. So my question is that uh, now that we know ourselves, because the issues that has been raised by the people from the Batu and the, the one from Ethiopia are the same that we face as a Honduras community here in Kenya, because the issues of uh, education level, we, 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 the, 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 the level of service, provided is not uh, the same with the dominant community. We, because our livelihood or the way we do, the way we, we live and the way we accept the issues to do education even within the community itself is still a challenge. So my question is that, can we have a mechanism in African Commission through the African Commission that, that, that captures the challenges that we go through as minority and uh, and, 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 and indigenous people all over the Africa, because the challenges we share in Kenya are the same challenges that the people in South Africa experience, are the same challenges that the uh, pastoral people in Burundi and, uh, and, and Patwa also go through. The issues of education up to this moment, we struggle to access uh, quality education. We struggle to access uh, issues of health. We okay. get health okay. Christine, facilities. Christine yes. we, have gotten the, we have gotten the question. It will be answered during the session on education. Thank you very much, Christine. Hi, thank you. Okay, I think up to this point, I know there are many people who have raised up their hands, including Jeremy, Wana from Ethiopia. Please, you can drop your comments on the chat box. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, the serious contributions and uh, all the panelists. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. But we will share the questions. Please feel free to answer them even after this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Geoffrey, for that uh, for uh, that moderation and uh, the session was a fantastic one. I think you will notice that the two uh, items we are discussing today are very closely related. People keep uh, referring to education. We are going to have a panel on education. Uh, but I think at the end of the two, I encourage everybody to stay on and we discuss more in depth. And um, I would like to not to get some, to read the comments I'm seeing from, uh, from uh, ECR Net Collins. Uh, Collins is asking, how do we build a collective and shared analysis around these issues and build people's power to address them? I think Collins is that a very strong question. We need to come to back to that one once we have done the second pan panel on education, and then we can be able to go in depth. Uh, as a reminder, before we go for a, we are going for a 20 minutes break, I think, then we come back, 15 minutes break, and then we come back. Um, but before we do that, I want to remind everybody here, I intentionally brought it in late, that uh, this uh, web, webinar is organized by Minority Race Group uh, Africa Office uh, in collaboration with uh, members of the Working Group on Indigenous People of the African Commission on Human and People's, uh, uh, People's Rights. Uh, right now, the Africa, the Africa Commission ordinary sessions are ongoing in the Banjul. So this discussion is very timely and is coming at the time when uh, NGOs also are making submissions and discussions are coming out. It's very important. And uh, I encourage the commissioner, I mean the commissioners and experts uh, in this uh, discussion. Uh, to pick on issues to share later with the commission. Uh, thank you so much. And this has been made possible by the Finnish government once again. So we are going for the 15 minutes break for someone to pick lunch. It's lunchtime here in Uganda and uh, for others to take a, a, a cup of tea and then we can come back and complete the second uh, panel. panel. Like? Yep. Hi, Agnes. Yeah, like I said, the people, we are going for break, uh, for 15 minutes break. Then uh, maybe you can, uh, then we people expect people to fall in back uh, or after the 15 minutes break. Yeah, we're okay. good. Thank you.
Uh, for people who are still there, I think we still use the same uh, forum when we come back. The same, they mean the same link. So let me go back and put it on the, everyone. Yes, Bob. How do we respond to the
Agnes, Agnes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Your your video your video is on. Oh, my video is on. Yeah, you put it. Okay, I'm. Uh... I have stopped it. I'm busy responding to comments. You'll start later when we meet. Okay, thank you so much for that correction. Uh, that's better now. Okay, please.
Um, yes, uh, hello members. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello. Have we, yes, have we come back? Yes, we are. Yeah, I'm encouraging people to come back and I'm sure others could have uh, tuned off and they're coming back. And um, we should uh, take the opportunity to hand over to Berka Chem Loons. Uh, Dr. Berka Chem, you're most welcome. Good and, morning, uh, Agnes. Good morning, Dr. Berka Chem. It's a pleasure to see you, your face. I hope you're seeing me as well. So Dr. Berka Chem will be taking us to the second panel on education. And uh, it has uh, Dr. Melaku, uh, Daniel Kobe, Mr. Daniel Kobe, and Mr. Fasizo Mwangu Mwanganize. So over to you, Dr. Belka Chem. Merci beaucoup. Agnès, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Est-ce que vous pourriez euh, sélectionner français, s'il vous plaît Pardon Est-ce que vous pouvez sélectionner français, s'il vous plaît Dans... Il y a un menu interprétation. Je vous en entends mal. Est-ce que vous m'entendez maintenant bah, C'est sélectionner français. Bon. Uh, we are on the phone. Yes, we can get you. OK, je peux y aller? Merci. Uh, donc, je disais uh, merci. Thank you, Agnès. Good morning to everyone. I was thinking the meeting will be only in in English. I'm happy to get the interpretation. Thank you to the organizer for the thinking of the translation. I'm expressing my joy to be uh, part of this discussion and uh, 
to discuss about uh, the the issues of uh, inclusive economic social cultural policies of minorities and indigenous peoples in Africa with a special focus on education and health. I'm thanking Anes for uh, uh, giving me the privilege to moderate uh, this session on uh, education. My, uh, it's also a pleasure to meet uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Kobe and the other. Uh, education uh, is uh, very important and uh, it's a critical point for these uh, minorities and indigenous communities. They are minorities and their identity is being the, um, is being threatened. Their culture and their way of life, uh, if not existing uh, will uh, lead to the disappearance and existence of these communities. It is therefore very important to promote and protect uh, the right of the, these communities to education, culture, and equally their uh, way of life. Uh, Uh, considering the importance of this uh, uh, this uh, aspect of education, cultures, and language of uh, indigenous communities and uh, minorities, the international, uh, the different international mechanisms or frameworks, the Convention on the Right of Minorities, the UN DRIP, uh, the African Charter, all these uh, instruments uh, give a special place to uh, education, language, and uh, their culture. So I will be uh, giving the floor to, to the panelists, my colleague uh, at the working group on indigenous people, I, that I don't need to <laughs> present. Uh, he has been working on the issues for several years and with a special focus on indigenous, indigenous peoples. He will, he will share with us uh, the African perspective We will later uh, listen to Daniel Kobe, who has uh, been working uh, in promoting and protecting the right of indigenous with a special focus on uh, the Oge case and uh, with uh, the success of the Oge case at uh, the African uh, level with regard to the Oge case to access to land. He will be sharing with us the issues of IPs in uh, Kenya. The, next, the third speaker will be Fazio, uh, uh, who will be talking about uh, the issues of uh, indigenous communities in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, she is a holder of uh, a master degree in on gender. We have a very rich and uh, powerful panel, and we will now begin uh, with uh, Dr. Melaku. Thank you.
Thank you, Lunes, time that you are giving me. Uh, I would like to know how, how many minutes uh, I'm allotted to. Lunes. Il est prévu 15 minutes, Melaku. Uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. Yes. This minute. All right, then I have to be quick. quick. Yes. All right, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, importance of education to indigenous peoples. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, needless to say that uh, education is extremely important to indigenous communities. And that in fact is why uh, two of the most important international instruments for indigenous peoples, the, namely the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and ILO Convention 169 clearly stipulate the importance of education to indigenous peoples. Uh, <clears throat> it has been also emphasized through sort of several and several forums and other uh, international panels on uh, dealing with indigenous peoples that education is key to development and uh, personal uh, as well as social development for indigenous peoples. Uh, let me say that <clears throat> uh, education is essential, particularly for indigenous peoples, because one, uh, it relates to social development as far as indigenous peoples are concerned. And it particularly, it relates to social empowerment of indigenous communities. Education is key for these two important processes. Now, uh, when we deal with education, it's not just about education, it's not about indigenous communities because Education in this sense deals with one formal education for children and civic education for the youth. I mean, for the, 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 the rest of the community, because uh, <clears throat> as I said, uh, education is key to indigenous peoples because it is connected with social empowerment of the community. And you don't empower community just by educating children, but also by educating the entire community on specific issues uh, that deals with uh, the social transformation within that particular society. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, we emphasize on children because children constitute uh, as a generational domain of development, social development, but at the same time, we also have to focus for the rest of society, indigenous society, because uh, it's extremely important for self-empowerment and the social empowerment of the community as a whole. Now, education also poses another important element within this social transformation that we are thinking about indigenous communities, namely uh, an eman emancipatory project dealing with gender relations. Uh, indigenous communities being traditional uh, reflect, in most cases reflect uh, unequal relationship between men and women. Uh, therefore, to that extent, uh, there is a great deal of work to be done to bring that equality within indigenous communities. Needless to say that women are really, really marginalized and excluded from uh, uh, decision-making processes within indigenous communities. And it's very important when we deal, when we uh, argue and we fight for emancipation of indigenous communities as a whole, we also have to fight for gender equality within uh, <clears throat> in these communities. And they can only be done through massive civic, civic education addressing the entire community. So education is not just for the youth, it's also for the entire society. If we are thinking about social empowerment of the community and uh, the social transformation taking a, taking education as emancipatory project for women. This is very important. The other element uh, of why education is key to indigenous communities is the fact that as stipulated in the UN declaration, it's important that uh, indigenous children uh, go through and be uh, uh, you know, uh, propped up 
with their own history, with their own indigenous knowledge system, which the community as a whole doesn't want to forget them. Therefore, it is important. Uh, education is important from the perspective of indigenous history and from the perspective of indigenous values. We know that indigenous communities are extremely important and extremely useful values because they have a very specific indigenous knowledge system, which the rest of the world might and should learn from. Uh, therefore, there are a great deal of extremely important values within this knowledge system, which on the one hand should be retained by the community, by educating children, and it, it, it has to be shared by uh, the larger community outside the indigenous uh, communities as a whole. Uh, <clears throat> one other element uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, values uh, to be maintained by education, uh, uh, then what, you know, what kind of education are we thinking about when it comes to uh, pastoral communities, for example? Uh, there is transhuman nature of pastoralism in Africa. Therefore, uh, we have to come up with creative ideas as to how to uh, uh, provide education on regular basis to pastoral children. And that that's bring us to the question of mobile schools. And we also have to think uh, in, in terms of other uh, social services like, like uh, health services through mobile clinics and so on and so forth. But the most important thing uh, in the pastoral life, which uh, as part of the uh, indigenous knowledge system should be retained and that the rest of that should also learn from pastoral communities, the fact that their attitude towards the environment is absolutely crucial. Because they depend on the environment, they are the ones who protect the environment. And in fact, in some pastoral communities, such as the Afar in Ethiopia, they have a specific laws within their uh, communities, such as like uh, uh, it's a, it is, uh, you know, anybody who found a cutting tree will be fined in terms of cattle or money. You see, that much is, uh, uh, you know, that much is the value really given to the protection of the environment by, indigenous, uh, by uh, pastoral communities. So these are the kind of values that we have to retain and we know, uh, we know uh, what happened at the global level. Uh, and um, <clears throat> to start video, okay, I will start the video. And um, <clears throat> uh, we know what happened last week or the, a, few, a few days ago in uh, uh, Glasgow, the world is confronted with uh, uh, deteriorating uh, climate change situation, uh, which science also Scientists also uh, warn us that we only have 11 years to go to uh, really check and uh, uh, control the, the, the downgrading of the international world climate. Uh, therefore, it is extremely important and urgent that the world should act to control the, 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 the climate change processes. It is in this sense, then the world has a lot to learn from pastoral communities who are the champions of protecting the environment. Uh, so, so this is, the, you know, this poses a paradox in terms of so-called civilizations. When uh, uh, so-called advanced societies or societies who consider themselves as advanced and consider indigenous communities as backward, traditional and so on, then at the end of the day, we see that it is indigenous communities who are the, the custodians of this world because of their attitude towards the environment. Now, this is essential to be uh, consolidated and continue through education. Education plays an important role in transforming, uh, in transmitting these messages, not only to indigenous communities, but also to you know, other communities in the, in the rest of society. Now, <clears throat> uh, Let's start with the normative, uh, in, in the normative sense, uh, what can, you know, those who hold the natural the resources, who have the resources, what can they do uh, in order to provide proper education to indigenous communities? 
no doubt about that, you know, no doubt that the state, uh, the so-called state and international communities uh, have a huge resource to, uh, to unleash a massive education to indigenous communities, you know, the kind of education that indigenous communities need. That is in the normative sense, but in actual fact, uh, do states and international community, do they want to provide the kind of education that we're talking about to indigenous communities? That is an issue that, uh, you know, we have to really think about, but which I think, or I seriously doubt that uh, states and international community are really interested to provide education to indigenous communities because these two forces expect indigenous communities to change and transform into a mainstream society. So that goes into contradiction to, uh, uh, to the, you know, the, the, to the very foundation of indigenous communities, uh, societies and so on. Now, <clears throat> uh, somebody was mentioning the uh, question of decolonization, but decolonization cannot take place uh, uh, without really going into uh, the analysis of uh, looking into the impact of colonization on indigenous communities. What did colonization de do to the larger communities in Africa and to indigenous communities in particular? I remember once in 2002, I think, uh, uh, attending a UNDP meeting in Gaborone, uh, Botswana. And at the, beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, there was this minister, I don't know what minister he was, Botswana minister addressing the meeting. And uh, <clears throat> there were about 15 to 20 members of the San community sitting right in the, in the room. And he, he was pointing at them and say, these savages. So, uh, you know, people with that kind of mentality can never provide any kind of, any kind of assistance or anything in terms of policy towards indigenous communities. No, people in power should change radically their attitude towards indigenous communities and only then can come, they can come up with a proper policy uh, to, towards uh, enhancing the well-being of indigenous communities. So to that extent in, in Africa as a whole, uh, I have never come across any government that has a specific policy on either pastoral development or indigenous people's development. The only exception is the government in Ethiopia who came up with a policy of pastoral development last year, which is a major breakthrough, not only to Ethiopia, but also the rest of the continent. Uh, so this, this is actually, this is the beginning of change for indigenous communities, not only in a specific country, but also to the rest of uh, you know, the, the continent, if and only if other governments learn from the experience of uh, specific countries such as Ethiopia. Now, <clears throat> coming back to decolonization, it's extremely important that uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, people in power, uh, people in the mainstream, uh, in the mainstream media, in the mainstream academia, and in, you know, people who consider themselves the inter intelligentsia of a given country must really think very seriously and decolonize their mentality. Everybody should ask, where did this idea come from? Who inculcated this in my mind to think that way or this way? So decolonization should start at the personal level and of course, it has to be taken at an institutional level by academic institutions who should seriously work towards decolonizing the African elite because it is the African elite that is really uh, uh, selling out indigenous communities in the continent. If we have to speak the truth, then it has to come up uh, like that. Uh, <clears throat> now, when we come to the normative versus reality, the reality is extremely bad uh, as far as indigenous communities in Africa are concerned, and of course minorities as well. But uh, the normative is uh, people can struggle. There is no doubt that 
you cannot change the situation without a struggle. Indigenous peoples and their supporters and democratic forces must all combine to fight against decolonization. And this is elitist approach towards development, social development. And this is elitist approach uh, considering indigenous communities are uh, you know, uh, backward savages and so on and so forth. So it is extremely important that uh, struggle is required at this front and nothing changes without, uh, without a struggle. The other element is solidarity. Indigenous people need solidarity very, very badly. African indigenous communities, as well as minorities who are fighting for equality and social development really need solidarity from their friends all over the world. It is very, very important. And of course, we have to work. Indigenous communities first have to work towards this, attaining solidarity, gaining solidarity from the rest of the world. It's very important. <clears throat> That's why uh, networking at uh, the continental level, at uh, international level, world level, is extremely crucial for indigenous communities. Very, very important. Now, <clears throat> having said that, let me say that uh, in all this, education is key because <clears throat> you cannot struggle without having a proper consciousness, without a proper understanding of the existing situation and the kind of solution that is required for indigenous communities. That can only be gained through education. You cannot express solidarity without having a level of knowledge about uh, the conditions of other peoples elsewhere. And you cannot go into networking unless you can uh, contribute uh, towards, uh, you know, uh, be it regional or international struggle for the realization of equality at the global level. So I think uh, let me stop here and um, invite questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Melaku, pour, uh, Thank you, Dr. Melaku, for this uh, intervention, very rich, uh, as usual. We will come back uh, with questions later on. I the recognition and the preservation of indigenous people's values and knowledge, their, their right to uh, education, their way of life, their recognition as indigenous people and equally uh, their recognition as people uh, the, the the role the, the important role they play in the preservation of climate a lack of uh, uh, political will from uh, international organizations and states uh, to uh, accept accept the existence of indigenous people in Africa uh, Time is running, but uh, we don't uh, really see the recognition of indigenous people and minorities in uh, uh, Africa and the role they have to play in, uh, in the society. Daniel, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, Good morning, thank you very uh, much. Daniel. Thank you. You can hear me? Okay. Um, let me take this uh, opportunity to um, discuss a bit about um, 
the Ogier community. And as uh, Dr. Melako was speaking, I, I could just see, we, we talk about indigenous peoples and maybe minorities, but sometimes there are some indigenous people who are more marginalized than the other indigenous peoples. For, for this part, I could talk about the hunter gatherers. The hunter gatherers in Africa, for instance, are more marginalized than the other indigenous peoples. You talk about, I had somebody talk about the Batwa on health issues, talk about the, the Ogiek, you talk about the Yaku, the other communities, Sengwe and the rest in Africa, the San people, and most of the indigenous and uh, under the hunter gatherers uh, uh, perspective. But in this case, today is a very interesting subject for me because I talk a lot about the Ogiek and the land issues, but today I'm privileged and uh, honored to speak about education, which, which is something I take in the bottom of my heart. And, and I want to sincerely say that this particular um, moment, I feel that as indigenous minorities, there are a lot to be discussed about us. And uh, the right to education, um, sometime, uh, Diva, um, let me just a minute. Anyway, um, allow me to reorganize myself. Um, um, yes. Um, The right to education, that means that the right is guaranteed legally. Find a way. Je crois que nous avons perdu euh, Daniel. I think we have lost Daniel. Okay, he's back, I think.
maybe sometime uh, it's, it's good to speak. Uh, well, uh, when, when you discuss about education, uh, you will always see that there is always a challenge in, 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 in a country like Kenya, where people see education in a different perspective. One, most of the education system which we have now, like in the areas where the indigenous peoples are, people are supposed to be taught mother tongue or from uh, class one or from nursery to, to class three or primary three in some countries. And in these areas, you find that some of the indigenous peoples like Ogier community do not have a chance to have the books printed in their languages. So you can imagine if you go to school, you are forced to learn in another language. You are not necessarily speaking in Ogier language. So this makes it very hard for these particular children to have a chance to learn their mother tongue. Secondly, there is an issue of what you call Kenya uh, curriculum development. Kenya curriculum development means that you are developing a curriculum to be used. But in this case, this curriculum does not cover indigenous and minorities. So you are always disadvantaged in many ways that some of the education or some of the materials which are there are not printed in, the, in, the, in your matter. So those children will not get a chance to learn their language. So this interferes with their language. Secondly, access to education is another challenge among indigenous peoples. And, and you will always find that they are having a big challenge because the distance, I remember we had a, a, a study whereby the distance for most of the children and they had to cross a bridge, which is only one and many times you find if, it, if, the, if the river is overflowing, these particular children will not get a chance to go to school. So this has been a big interference amongst the indigenous communities like the Ogier. So these children will go to school when they are already overgrown or they will not go to school completely. Now, the worst come when you are a, a girl when you go to school, you're already overgrown. And then within a short time, they get married off, which some of it we faced during the COVID-19. Most of the girls dropped out of school. So this issue which we are discussing has been one of the greatest embedment among the indigenous communities, especially those who are the minorities, indigenous communities from the hunter-gatherer background, because as they are struggling, like now we struggle for land, but we cannot forget education. So the basics, you are struggling for land, here is children must go to school. And yet when they go to school, they don't learn in their own languages. And, and, and when they, the, 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 some of the people, they told me that if you print an Ogiek book in Ogiek language for the curriculum, who will buy the book? Because they are, the Ogiek are a minority. So nobody will buy. So for the printers or the businessmen, they find it very expensive to print a book in a Greek language or in Sengwer language or in, in other communities across this. You know, I know not only Kenya, in other communities where language issue is a problem. And even others, like one, some of my friends from Botswana is telling me, they are forced to really learn the Swana language instead of the San or Basara language. So these are all the challenges indigenous peoples are facing across Africa. And, and, and one other issue which I feel it is very important to, to really discuss, that the accessibility, which I've already mentioned, and also reliability or challenge to have a chance to go to school is a great thing. And you know, because of the poverty, which also is close in, in, within the indigenous communities. Most of them don't go to school. So parents used to share, say, let the boys go to school, the girls to remain, or two children to go to school, others remain for labor purposes, and all these interferes with education amongst them. So, and, and then again, when some of them go to school, to maybe to colleges, when they come back home, they don't get jobs. When they don't get jobs, the other people will say, why should you go to school? 
if X went to school and he is, is jobless, why should you go to school? So, so when also the people go to colleges and, and, and the kind of courses we, we study are not focused towards jobs. And when you come back and there's no job, nobody cares really more about um, your, your level of, of, of work. And they say, man, there's no need to go to school after all. When you come back, you are just like any other person who never went to, went to school, you will tilt a farm or do all this or go and take care of animals. So in, in all this kind of work, which indigenous people are doing, a lot of and less documentation, the documentation we did, which covered the same way, the Ogiek and some other communities, we, are, we realized there's a big challenge in the schools and the performance of schools within indigenous peoples and minority communities. And uh, in this case, because I know time is not on my side, I, I wish to say that more studies needs to be carried out to unearth the challenges which minorities and indigenous communities are facing in Africa. Because we may say education, like now in Kenya, if you ask somebody, can you support education? They say in the Kenyan system, we have said there's free education in primary school, free education in secondary school. But in reality, who will pay for uniform for all these other uh, necessities? These children will always have a challenge. So I wish to say, I'm sorry that I had a problem with the whatever, but I'll, I'll share with the with the, um, the, the the coordinators. Thank you very much. Est-ce que Daniel a fini, a fini? Oui, il a fini. He... Yes, he's done. You have finished, Daniel? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Kobei. Uh, pardon, je parle en anglais maintenant. Je... Merci beaucoup et je retiens également. Thank you, Daniel. Indigenous languages are marginalized, are, are discriminated. Education, uh, indigenous uh, children are uh, right to education is uh, discriminated and marginalized. Uh, marginalized. Uh, that leads to their uh, non-existence, the impact of uh, poverty uh, uh, that uh, uh, contributes to children not going to school because uh, the indigenous parents don't have access, uh, don't have the means uh, to provide uh, all their schools need. So now I'll be giving the floor to the third uh, speaker. Patsizo, you have the floor. You will be talking about the access to education uh, of indigenous people and minorities in Zimbabwe. You have the floor. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I can see that you're having difficulties in pronouncing my name. Uh, so my name is Patsizo Fadzisai Maonga Nide. And I'm with an organization called Katsuka Sisterhood. And uh, with support from MRG, we are working in a Bire district that is Mashonal and Central, where we are working on um, issues of access to health and issues of access to education uh, for the Doma community. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to um, give uh, the background of the community that we are working in, uh, the challenges that they have in accessing education, as well as what can be done uh, by organizations that are working with minority groups. And I'm also going to uh, include the laws 
um, in the policies that are there in Zimbabwe as far as access to education is concerned. Um, as Katsuka sister would, uh, we are implementing the project on access to education in Ward 1 uh, and Ward 2, uh, that is in Irira, in the Kanyempa community, where they are the Doma people. Um, the Doma people in Zimbabwe, they stay far away from uh, other villages and uh, they are people who are shy um they don't want a time to mingle with other people um and according to the 2018 census we have about 1350 uh, doma people in zimbabwe uh some of the people uh, from the doma community they survive on hunting uh gathering poaching and some of them they work um in the tourism um tourism sector, that is the work um, in the game parks that are near their community. And also the uh, food distribution from the Ministry of Social Welfare and also World Food Program and other organizations um, that also distribute food in the communities. So the challenges that uh, they have or that we have in Zimbabwe as far as accessing education uh, is concerned, is that there is um, the issue of long distance to the schools. Uh, for example, in what uh, uh, two, uh, where the Irira people are, they walk about 10 to 12 kilometers uh, to the nearest school. And also is the same as in what uh, two, uh, where there is uh, the um, Doma people from the Kanyempa border post, uh, they walk also about 19 kilometers uh, to walk um, 19 kilometers to the nearest the primary and secondary school. And you find that uh, according to the Zimbabwean uh, education policy, a people should suppose is supposed to walk uh, a maximum of five kilometers uh, um, to the nearest school, not more than that, which is a challenge. Along the way, there is also the issue of uh, human uh, wildlife conflict. And because of that, uh, most of the children, they end up uh, not going to school. Uh, like what I highlighted uh, above that, uh, the issue of uh, wild, human wildlife conflict, there are incidences whereby some of the people have been uh, killed uh, by elephants and also some where they've been attacked by buffaloes or, um, or lions. Um, also coupled to that, uh, during uh, the rain season, uh, the children, they miss a whole term that is four months uh, due to flooded rivers. So for example, in Irira, they cross about four rivers uh, to go to that school that I mentioned that is about 10 kilometers. And uh, in order to they cross about two rivers to get to the school that is about uh, 19 kilometers. Um, there's also lack of uh, proper documentation for the children. Uh, most of them, they don't have identity uh, documentation. They don't have uh, birth certificates. Their mothers, they don't have birth certificates, which uh, cause a challenge for them to register when they want to go maybe for grade one or grade or the ECD. And also, uh, like what I said, that uh, most of the people in the communities, uh, they don't work. And uh, at times, uh, parents, they cannot afford uh, school fees for, your, for their children, uh, which, uh, which is a challenge. Um, adding on to that, uh, the issue of uh, language that was highlighted um, with the previous speakers, you find out that uh, for the Doma community in Ward, um, in Ward 1, uh, they use the Chikunta language, which is also not part of the curriculum, uh, so which also pose a challenge to them. There's also issue of uh, lack of access to educational materials. This is just general in Zimbabwe, whereby, you know, uh, in some schools, they there is no uh, proper infrastructure. Uh, there are no uh, textbooks. 
there are no uh, benches, um, which also pose a challenge even for those uh, uh, people from the minority groups. Uh, then also there is the issue of uh, unavailability of uh, teachers, um, especially in rural communities of Zimbabwe. Uh, this poses a challenge uh, that uh, you find out that uh, one teacher can have a ratio of about um, 100 students, which is also a challenge. Uh, even if when they go to school, uh, they are not uh, sort of like given, um, they are not uh, sort of like supported by, by those teachers because there are a few teachers in the schools. Um, those are the challenges that, that are there as far as um, access to education for, for the minority groups are uh, focusing on the Doma communities concerned. I'm going on to look at the Zimbabwe educational policies. Uh, we have the um, educational bill in Zimbabwe and also our constitution, uh, section 75 of our constitution, uh, it stipulates the right to education, that every citizen and permanent resident of Zimbabwe is a right to a basic uh, state-funded education, including adult education, as so well as um, measures that are going to be taken uh, to uh, include issues around availability and accessibility uh, of, um, of education. Then uh, in 2020, the Zimbabwe government adopted the Education Amendment Act uh, to align the Education Act with the country's um, uh, with the country's constitution. So those are the laws that we have, and also what is being done uh, from that. Uh, I've uh, picked about one or two what uh, the government is doing uh, as far as supporting. Uh, the rights of, of the minority. So the Zimbabwe uh, government introduced the basic education assistant module uh, that is being, uh, that pays for uh, primary and secondary education, school fees, and those are students who cannot uh, afford uh, in Zimbabwe. And this is another opportunity that uh, the minority groups um, can have as far as accessing education is concerned. Um, then also, um, the government has introduced uh, adult, adult literacy program, uh, which supports those classes um, um, that are uh, yes, adults. Um, then we also recently, the government of Zimbabwe introduced uh, what is called the continuous assessment learning activity, uh, color in short, uh, which offers an opportunity for learners uh, to conduct uh, detailed research-based activities, um, which also adds uh, to their marks for the um, uh, national examination. Um, there is also the issue of uh, retention of pregnant girls in school. Uh, those girls who want to go, uh, while least they are pregnant, uh, they are allowed to do so with support from, from the teachers. So you find out that from the policies and the laws that I have uh, actually highlighted, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, minority and indigenous groups uh, from Zimbabwe to be part of that. Um, adding on to that, we also have another minority group uh, uh, that is called the same that are in the uh, southern uh, part of Zimbabwe uh, with support uh, from um, another organization that is also focusing on uh, uh, the rights of the minority group. They managed to build a school uh, that is supporting their education. And also on that, uh, the um, government of Zimbabwe uh, on our constitution, they've recognized uh, Khoisan as uh, one of the languages uh, in the constitution. So basically I'm saying that um, what can be done with us is that there's the issue of um, 
uh, working together. There's the issue of uh, networking, uh, the issue of support uh, and solidarity uh, that was talked uh, earlier on by the previous speakers so that uh, they can actually access uh, education. Um, then there's also the issue of raising awareness and also having community dialogues uh, and sensitization uh, sessions with the community so that they can realize the importance um, of uh, the, ed the importance of education. Uh, adding on to that, we have uh, traditional leaders uh, in, the, um, in the Doma community. So there's also need to work with those gatekeepers so that they can be on the forefront advocating for access to education for the um, Doma community and also embracing color uh, that I've uh, highlighted uh, earlier on is part of uh, practical education. So in a nutshell, uh, yes, there are challenges that are there, but there are also opportunities uh, that are there if we work together um, and also push for the rights of uh, the Doma community in accessing education. I thank you. Merci beaucoup, Fadizo, pour cette. Thank you very much, Fadizo. Nous retrouvons un peu beaucoup des problèmes que vous avez soulevés, des accès à l'éducation au Zimbabwe que l'on retrouve dans d'autres pays d'Afrique et même en Côte d'Ivoire. Et merci beaucoup pour. Thank you, Kagizo, for sharing with us and also on the good practices you have shared with us uh, and how we can do to encourage access uh, to education of indigenous and minority groups in Zimbabwe. I will give back the floor to Agnes for debates and The, the question of indigenous people and minorities with regard to access to education. Our educational system should uh, consider teaching and uh, uh, learning in indigenous people's languages and that uh, we should encourage our communities to speak and learn in their own language and not uh, being imposed uh, language from other dominant communities. Education, values, knowledge, their beliefs should not be replaced uh, with uh, that of other communities. And I'm worried about uh, the the, 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 the development or, uh, of indigenous communities and minorities. And yes, I give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Belkachem. And it's a pleasure to having listened to your moderation. Thank you for that. And uh, my remaining work is simple. First, let me respond to Sali Jango listening to us. Uh, I, knew, I, I wanted to remind uh, members participating today that um, there are some of the pattern of um, colleagues here who have a full, um, I mean, a full rooms um, by indigenous populations attending and listening into the debate, like uh, Christine Candy from the Endorways Women Council. They have participants listening in, and um, uh, Mboskuda from Cameroon. They have participants in the room listening into this discussion. So it's a great honor to have you in this meeting. And uh, um, Mr. Sally, uh, I would say the meeting is almost ending. We have uh, to discuss the way the the plenary now and the way forward. And then we have to discuss a little bit on the declaration, which I will find out from Geoffrey where we are. Then we are ending. So we have a few minutes remaining to end this meeting. Let's say 20 minutes from now. So 
Yes, um, back to the discussion. We are now moving to the plenary session. And uh, I'm encouraging participants to raise your hand and uh, we continue with engagement with the questions related to education, the plenary on education. So. Please, you can raise your hand. Then I will know you want to speak and uh, then we like that. If you want, if you have a question, if you want a contribution, please click on the raise your hand and then we can be able to give you the opportunity to contribute or uh, ask questions to the participants as well as to the presenters and the, the panelists. The panelists will be able to respond to you after. Thank you. Any question? Anyone with a question? I have, I'm seeing a, a message is coming in. Um, Dr. Iltiza Begum uh, is thanking us for presenting such a good program. Uh, thank you also for tuning in. Uh, there is um, Robert from UNCD, UNCIDA in Bundibujo is also thanking us for the program. Uh, thank you, Robert, for also joining in. Uh, there is uh, Charles from Topoth. Topoth Charles is saying, uh, can others have a brief um, attributes in an in an in country experience? Sure, that is possible. As part of the plenary, you can raise your hand and share in the country experience from the country you're coming from. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello, Charles. Yes. You can take I up the floor. I am Charles. Yes, I come from the northeastern part of Uganda, uh, the greater part called Karamoja. I am privileged to be part of this webinar. I thank all the organizers, minority rights group. I would like to thank all the panelists and all of those who have joined in this webinar. As matters that we are discussing are crucial for human life. Uh, I would like to contribute uh, in uh, in an issue pertaining the indigenous peoples related to health and education. I think the first attribute that the indigenous people should engage in is education. Education in a sense that where do we play the stake of taking up education? It is from our attitudes. If our attitudes do not or if our attitudes front our culture than going maybe to have the formal education. I could call it learning because education can be formal or informal. But the formal education has been taken to be the one that now is being put as a challenge to that. A shot is that the legal framework or the official regimes that are developed by governments do not include the indigenous people in terms of consultancy. An example is here in Uganda. I have been tracking a lot of legal frameworks in the country 
that is the environment, uh, the National Environment Act and the Uganda Wildlife Act that was assented by the president in 2019 was so challenging to forest in, de in de uh, dependent communities and those adjacent to protected areas. And when we went to parliament, it was very hard to get a copy of the bill before it was assented. One of the things I put forward is, much as we have particular indigenous people's challenges, we must learn to champion ourselves as society to engage proactively and in solidarity with others over the emerging uh, uh, legal regime that is now in Uganda. We have 20 bills now pending to be assented. And one of it is, it was blocked yesterday as I also escaped from the area of the bombs. I'm in Kampala. We were going to have to attend the first reading of the mining and the mineral bill, which is going to affect the entire region of Karamoja. So one of the things is, I would like to challenge my brothers that much as the laws have national circumstances, what is our role as regional partners in Africa to play and inform, like in East Africa, we have the East African Legislative Assembly. What is our take at that front? What are we playing at the AU desk so that all these subnational regional frameworks can inform the national circumstances? Because we know national circumstances, it's difficult for smaller communities to, to engage into. That is why I still look at the proactiveness we bring as indigenous people into course is never put into practice. Cited example is the Bennett case of 2005, I participated by uh, collecting 520 signatures in Karamoja to support the case, which was one. But when they came to practicing, following up of the ruling of the I code, it has remained in thin air and it has become a song to say our rights, and yet we are not playing our part. Another is a recent case that has been won by the Batwa may lie suit to the very experience of the Bennett issue. And yet, in the context of Karamoja, we have gone to engage the political class right from the executive. The Tepe, the Tome, the Nyangia, and the Ik all have seed secondary schools, which with each sub-community having four primary schools on average. So our proactiveness requires the best practices we can engage. One of the most unfortunate in terms of health is the way we are depleted our ideas in terms of research. I've just, I just commented it when we were closing for lunch. The health, we are now people who are only practicing village health teams and yet if you went to places like Kamoja, they have just discovered something which is going and you are breaking off uh, copyrighted by Dr. Ogwang in Western in, in my the, 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 the medicine, the herbal medicine we call. You are breaking off, I think. And uh, hello. You need, yeah, you are breaking off, and you need also to summarize so that you give a chance to others. Hello. Uh, hello. 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 Yes, Charles. I'm saying you are breaking off, and yes, uh, if, if I can back, summarize, am I at? Hello. Okay. Can you summarize in the form of key recommendations you put to this uh, debate? Yeah, the key, yeah, my key recommendation is we need the support to the educators, true people to support every sector where they have challenges. One is 
uh, we raise scholarships that can focus on sectors like education so that the indigenous people. The second one is uh, to make that uh, Badly. Buana Charles, I will encourage you to write down your recommendation and send them in the channel so that we can pick them up. And uh, I will I will cut you off and maybe you can give a chance to others. Charles, if you are hearing me, please, I'm going to ask you to stop. And also to support legal or policy pertaining what they can have. Okay, okay. Yes, because I'm so sorry your internet wasn't uh, clear, but we will capture your issues if you send them in a message. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Participants listening in, please, um, you can share recommendations as well as any other question you have. Then that way we still we able to capture some of the key recommendations. Mm -hmm. From the present, from the short uh, input from um, Topos Charles, he rings out issues on uh, formal and informal education, and says that there is a need to pay attention to the informal education as well uh, as part of the learning process. I think that one takes us back to the presentation of um, Joshua, uh, Professor Joshua Castellino. He talked about the issue of um, the quality of education and the appropriateness of education. So then also the, the, he raised the question, the issue around minerals and mining in Karamoja, and he was looking at the bill in the parliament. I think uh, Karamoja region is an area we've talked about of, uh, with the full of wealth, mineral wealth, and uh, that has become a problem and a curse to the indigenous populations in Karamoja because uh, it has, uh, rather than bringing wealth, it is bringing in more marginalization and um, as people face challenges, including child labor. So I will leave it at that. Then he talked about uh, knowledge, indigenous knowledge on medicine, for example, and um, implementation of cases that is access to justice for the indigenous populations who have taken cases against their governments to courts, either local courts uh, in the state or outside the state of the African Commission, we need more action around the implementation of those cases. So please, other members. Hello. Hello. Uh, I can see a raised hand, uh, but can may I know from who? Yeah, um, uh, it's Christine. Uh, I'm, I'm here with other fellow members of the community and they add their own uh, question they wish to share. So maybe uh, I can wait to introduce myself and maybe ask the question. Thank you. And, and, and okay. Christine, I'm limiting you to something like two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Madam, for the educative uh, lesson we have okay. learned. Eh? I want to assess particularly the okay. issue of education. Okay. Huh? I'm Christopher Yesere, Madam. Are you getting me? Hello? Yes, we are getting you. We okay. are getting you. Okay. I am addressing particularly the issue of education, eh? because we have discussed and learned. Now, I am from uh, Kenya, particularly the interest community. We have, a, we have a problem on the challenge about the uh, issue of human resources eh? or recruitment of the, let's say, teachers in the colleges. So the government are very selective when it comes to recruitment and the, and the, and the grade they are giving it to the students. Now you realize that the students from the minority communities are not considered because they have not attained the, the highest grade. Now the government are taking from the areas where they have done more better. Also, the issue of the infrastructures in the minority communities whereby even if they are, the learners are there, the infrastructures are so pathetic for them whereby the learners cannot get that quality education because 
the area is so is not conducive for them to learn. Also, the issue of insecurity in some uh, indigenous communities where some communities who are more powerful can extend their, their manpower to displace them. And then when they do so, the vulnerable now, children and the women and others, get lost and education is dis dismantled completely. And uh, what, so, is your what is your recommendation? That the government should set policies which are conducive or, or uh, which fits every society, so that even the minority communities can get it. Also, they make awareness before they make any policy regarding the education or whatever, so that everybody can go in line with the system. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I did not get my, your name, uh, but uh, Christine, thank you so much for the member from the Endorways community. And uh, we appreciate your your, sub, your your contribution to this debate. I will go ahead yeah. to give the floor to Dr. Iltiza uh, Begum from India. Dr. Iltiza, are you online? Dr. Iltiza? Dr. Iltiza, I please. Can I take over if Dr. Itiza is not uh, online? Okay, we will give him a, another opportunity. She's calling for all the way from India, so we appreciate your presence here. Yes, uh, David, you are given two minutes, and please, uh, uh, in your contribution, also state uh, a recommendation you would like to take on. Thank you so much, Agnes, for this uh, opportunity, and I want to thank the panelists who have, who have raised many issues. But uh, my question is that uh, in uh, minority communities, particularly where I come from, that is uh, Benet indigenous community in Mount Elgon, Uganda, is that uh, the problem has been the issue of infrastructure. And uh, this one happened because of uh, the issue of resettlement, which has not been done because the government says that we can't put, we can't invest or build infrastructures in areas whereby resettlement has not been done. And that is the challenge which we have, like uh, the issues of schools, as well as the issues of health centers. So therefore, my question is that uh, at least the government can do, my recommendation is that the government can come up with the resettlement and they improve on the issue of infrastructure. And then also another thing is that uh, the government can consider also the minority communities in terms of quota system, whereby they can give them a chance to, to, to minority indigenous so that they also benefit, as well as the issues of uh, the indigenous community, they can tap in the knowledge which they have. For example, for us in uh, Mount Elgon, the Benet indigenous community, we had a knowledge on how to prevent tire breaks. And uh, this one can happen when we do grazing because the animals can create what we call the corridors. When fire comes, these corridors can prevent the fire from spreading through the old forest, therefore uh, preventing the destruction of the wild animals as well as the forest. Therefore, the government can tap in this knowledge which the community has and improve on the issue of uh, climate change, which is uh, happening as for now. And then also another recommendation is that uh, the African Commission should come in to support other minorities in countries like Uganda, whereby the government doesn't respect the rule of law, as Charles has stated, and uh, they don't involve the indigenous community. For example, the 2019 OA Act, which was passed without consulting the community which is affected and therefore making this community to be more vulnerable in payment of the uh, money. Like for example, in our community, once they get a cattle, you have to pay 50,000 and therefore making this community to be more vulnerable. So those are the issues which I wanted to raise up as a, a Benet indigenous community, as well as the issue of human rights abuses, which happens between the community and our community, whereby we have experienced many deaths, which is going on. Thank you so much, Agnes, for that opportunity. 
Thank you so much, Mtai and uh, Dr. Iltiz. Are you now uh, able to talk? He was muted, I think. Yeah, I was muted. Am I Dr. Iltiza, please? Am I audible? Okay, Am okay. I audible? nice to have you. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm also belong to the community and uh, I'm a minority community in India. And we also have a similar kind of circumstances where we are all communities educate will be aware about what is happening from that kind of site because we are okay. so that is what I want to do. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Iltiza and uh uh, I encourage you also to, to send again uh, your message because on the general everybody's uh, may, may chat because uh, your internet was really not so good. But thank you so much for the contribution and we appreciate your time and uh, tuning in from India. We know challenges of uh, developing countries are still uh, the same. There is a lot of uh, similarities in challenges faced with uh, ethnic minorities in India as well as uh, those on the African continent. So. Members who have more issues to raise, um, this will take us another like 10 minutes from now, and then we should be able to come to a conclusion. If nobody else is there, Geoffrey, Geoffrey Keros. Geoffrey Keros. Yes, sir, you know this here. Oh, yes, sir, Sally, you are on. Yeah, Agnes, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I think, you know, it's quite enriching, it's quite educating for us to have, you know, the wider context of indigenous people all over. Yeah, we are here, you know, we are about seven people here, uh, mm -hmm. indigenous and non-indigenous people. And uh, we have one or two questions. The first question is that, uh, you know, uh, one of the presenters talk about, you know, the education of indigenous people using their dialect. Uh, I don't know, in our Central Africa region here, where we come from, you know, we see that very, very difficult because even the recognition of the status of indigenous people is so difficult. So I don't know how this is possible to be done. Uh, we are thinking that, you know, maybe if countries want to show, show goodwill, then they have to, you know, adopt the convention 169, ILO convention 169, which is not happening. So is it possible for, for countries like ours in Central Africa to really adopt the indigenous language for teaching? Then the second question is, you know, uh, the team saying that, you know, we are not hearing people from indigenous people from West Africa. Are there indigenous people of West Africa who have recognized themselves as indigenous people and also recognized by their governments? We know pastoralists, moral pastoralists are found a lot in West Africa. So these are the few things we want to say. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sally Jiango from Cameroon. Um, we are your questions and uh, your contribution to the debate. But to adopt a language of uh, instruction, I mean the local language as a medium of instruction for indigenous populations, and he thinks it's very difficult. Uh, I cannot answer that question, but I encourage other people with the questions to respond to this. But uh, if I use the Ugandan experience, uh, Uganda, we have... Uh, Okay, Paul, Paul, uh, can you speak slowly and <laughs> mute? Um, uh, we have uh, a, a, a white paper on the use of languages, uh, local languages in, the, in education 
which uh, instructs uh, schools uh, from uh, preschool to primary three to use the local language to instruct uh, the, 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 the pupils in the local languages. The only problem that we have had as uh, ethnic minorities of Uganda is that um, they also, uh, in, 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 the in the using of local language, they could not be able to reach out to, this, to the um, least spoken languages. So they kind of generalized and they picked on four, nine major languages of the dominant communities. And that means if you, are lang if you are in a region where there is a dominating language, then you are forced to say to instruct your children in the language of the dominating community. And that is a problem because the, the question is, uh, if people are not, uh, want to maintain their culture, preserve their culture, then imposing a language of a dominating neighbor is going to be very problematic. So that is the main challenge currently with the Uganda. But there is that effort to make people instruct, I mean, pupils instructed in the local language. Uh, the question is, uh, can you reach out to all the languages? Do you have materials and the scholastic support that ensures that the languages are written and their teachers to, to instruct the pupils in the language, in their local languages? Uh, we still have a lot of challenges. That is the only ex experience I can give Sally on that. So uh, Sally raised another question on, um, whether there is recognition of indigenous or ethnic minorities in West Africa. And uh, I think um, that one is a question also I cannot uh, respond to. And I encourage people listening in from West Africa to share experience. But uh, what I know, they are ethnic minorities across West Africa uh, and, um, and, and, and in different countries. Uh, the question of whether they are recognized legally in those countries is what I cannot uh, respond to. Uh, yes. And of course, in West Africa, sadly, there is also religious minorities, like in some countries like Nigeria, where you have uh, um, minority Christians in Northern uh, Nigeria and a lot of challenges related to the being a, a, a religious minority. Um, somebody else who wants to contribute and uh, if there are no more, I'm not seeing any hand. There is this raised hand I'm not seeing. If there are no more, I'm going to move Geoffrey Keros, you were drafting something. Uh, thank you, Agnes, for this opportunity for me to, uh, to say something. Uh, we, our, our colleagues here and myself, we have been working on capturing the recommendations which uh, participants have raised from various countries. Uh, because they are, uh, this, uh, this, whatever we have captured is not conclusive, we would like to uh, continue working on it maybe for tomorrow then on friday we can share a draft of our 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 recommendations which we are hoping to share with the working group on indigenous populations and finally because we are we're the 69th session of the african commission uh, the african commission uh, is going on we can subsequently share uh, with our partners, uh, we make sure that these recommendations reaches the African Commission and subsequently to the states where we come from. So if that is agreeable, I will not, I will not read the draft which I have here. We might have missed one or two things. We will compare our notes, then come up with the final draft, uh, which we can share through email. And uh, more importantly, as uh, Agnes mentioned, those uh, participants who, are, who did not get a chance to give their recommendations, please, there is an email I've shared on chat. Uh, if you open the chat, you can see an email. Uh, it is Geoffrey Kerosi. That is geoffrey.kerosi at minorityrights.org. Uh, if you share your recommendations through that email, we can include them in the final recommendations to the African Commission. So we will share this draft for your input before we finally uh, 
take it to the African Commission to do the working group. If that is uh, agreeable, uh, then we can uh, make sure that we drop our email if we don't have it here, or we use the emails which we use to invite you for this uh, webinar. That is it, uh, Agnes, from my side. Okay, thank you so much, Geoffrey. Geoffrey is talking about a, a suggestion. If you, you, you see the program we shared, uh, a possibility of having a declaration on affirmative action on access to education and health for indigenous peoples in Africa. And this we intended to say through the, um, the kind of attention of the working group experts, working group on indigenous peoples and the ethnic minorities expert group uh, to be able to help us to refine it and then we can submit it to the African Commission. And uh, so thank you, Geoffrey, for taking lead on that. We could not have done it um, prior. So we are depending on the discussion that is coming in and uh, we are picking on the recommendations. And like Geoffrey has said, he will be now doing a draft and circulating it around your emails. Um, I have seen also on the chat, there is uh, a lot more of recommendation, Geoffrey, presented by Charles, suppose. Uh, thank you so much, Charles, for sharing that. Um, and I think uh, Geoffrey would be looking at them. I'm also seeing um, then contribution from Jane Dio from the Maragoli community in Uganda who is saying that uh, the issue of uh, language is very important because uh, the children from their community cannot express themselves in their mother tongue due to lack of self-esteem and fear to be called foreigners, both at school and in the community. The Maragoli community are a community that are at risk of statelessness because of uh, the currently the government failing to recognize them as one of the ethnic communities in Uganda. So. We have taken your point. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, Paul, did you have something to put across? Paul, Paul Masese, you have raised your hand. Um, yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I have, um, I have since lowered my hand. Huh? Um, but I must say this has been quite an interesting conversation and um, I'm looking forward to the draft that is being prepared by Kerosi and uh, hopefully I will be in a position to input. Uh, but so far so good, quite uh, an important conversation we've had here and hopefully we receive the need for broader partnerships uh, among minority communities across the continent and uh, elsewhere for greater uh, and stronger voices in forums uh, uh, that uh, would make appropriate policy and legislative um, frameworks uh, for the regarding of uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. Thanks a lot, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paul. And I think we come to an end of our questions and answers. And I would like to thank all the people who have participated in this uh, webinar. And uh, most importantly, uh, the panelists, our panelists who have uh, presented, uh, given us uh, uh, a basis for the discussion. I would like you to thank uh, in absence here, um, expert Leslie Jansen from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, uh, Mochungus Dennis uh, from AICM, uh, Araso Babu from uh, Ethiopia, uh, Dr. Melaku, uh, also expert on uh, working group on indigenous people. Uh, also, I would like to thank, um, to thank uh, Fazizo Maunganize uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, 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 you, your presentation was very, very important. I, I have uh, not forgotten um, the indigenous populations, children who have to cross uh, a national park and uh, they have to conflict with animals. That's and how do they get education? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel Kobe. And uh, uh, Daniel Kobe has uh, shared the presentation 
in chat if you can download it you can download it that would be wonderful and uh, with that i would like to hand over to dr melaku on behalf of the working group on indigenous people to give a final word and the close of the meeting of the debate thank you so much dr melaku are you still there dr melaku yes okay i hand over yeah i'm still around Thank you, Agnes. Um, <clears throat> I must say that this is uh, a very good and uh, interesting forum. And I encourage MRG to continue uh, organizing such a forum. And I hope uh, a number of people from the African Commission uh, currently meeting at the session, ordinary session, uh, also attending uh, this uh, uh, panel. Um, <clears throat> this panel organizing in collaboration with the African Commission uh, Working Group of Indigenous Populations. And I hope uh, this kind of uh, cooperation uh, will continue uh, with uh, MRG and, uh, you know, to create more, more forums for discussion and if possible, also is also something necessary. So I must say that uh, we're actively taking part in this uh, panel, and a special thanks goes to Agnes who organized all this. Thank you very much.